order. We just came out of executive session. Um, and now we will do all the roll call. Everybody's present tonight with us. We do the flag salute and ask Mr. Nolan Deuce to lead us in the flag salute. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you, Mr. Deuce, and happy birthday to you. Thank you. Thank you for joining us tonight. Now we move down to 4.01 to the agenda approval. How does the agenda look? Excuse me. Members? Now we move down to 5.01, the consent agenda. The purpose of the consent agenda is to approve routine matters. At the request of a board member, things can be moved down the consent agenda. What is the pleasure of the board? I request that we take out the PA, PA Association Agreement, the number, and is 5.03? Yeah. 5.03 out of the consent agenda. Move it to action. Move it to action. What number is that? Um, 5.03, so we move it down to 1311. Um, 1311. Okay. I move that we approve the amended consent agenda. I have a second. There's a motion with a second to approve the consent agenda as presented. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Abstentions. It's unanimous. Thank you very much. Now we move down to 6.01, Classified Employee Week. We have Governor Jay Ensley declaring March 14th, 18th as the Classified Public School Employees Week. And we would, as a tradition, like to recognize the contribution of our education and support professionals. And we have a proclamation, and Board Member Sarah Metner would like to read that and uh, give recognition to our classified employees who do so much for us. That's cool that these are the same one. I thought, oh no, I have to read two if you'd like to listen to me. All right. So I'm reading the proclamation. Whereas classified school employees are involved in nearly every aspect of education, maintaining buildings and grounds, preparing and serving meals, keeping school facilities clean and orderly, assisting in the classroom, performing and conducting research activities, Providing information technology and media services, administrative support functions, safe transportation, a secure and healthy environment, and many other specialized services, and whereas these dedicated individuals deserve recognition and thanks for the outstanding work they are doing for this state, their communities, and the students enrolled in Washington's public schools and universities, and whereas there are nearly 50,000 classified school employees working with and helping students in Washington's universities and public schools, and whereas classified school employees are instrumental in the state's responsibility to educate all students, and whereas by supporting the learning environment, classified school employees are crucial partners with professors, teachers, parents, administrators, and school boards in our education system. Now, therefore, I, J. Inslee, Governor of the State of Washington, do hereby proclaim March 14 through 18, 2016, as Classified Public School Employee Week in Washington, and I urge all people in our state to join me in this special observance. Thank you, Director Mehta. Thank you. Now we move down to 6.02, recognition of the PASD AmeriCorps program. We have Michelle Gentry here tonight to uh, rec be recognized for the wonderful work that AmeriCorps is doing and to share with us in a PowerPoint on AmeriCorps. And welcome, Michelle. Thank you. I'm pretty excited about this PowerPoint. We've never done this before. <laughs> You're laughing, but I'm serious. <laughs> Great. So we'll see how this goes. Uh, AmeriCorps is the common name for a variety of national community service organizations throughout the country, um, which include Reading Corps. Um, our AmeriCorps is called a state program. There's VISTA, there's RSVP, and we have AmeriCorps of all those types serving right here in our community. We're really excited to be serving as uh, education support in the Port Angeles School District um, and that has just come back into the district after a couple of years of absence. We're really excited to be here and to be part of the work nationwide but particularly here in our community. I can make this work. 
we're in the first year of a three-year cycle of granting. Um, what that means for us is that um, the expectations during this first year from the state are um, relatively minimal. Um, they, they want one thing, 100% of our files have to be done and complete. And guess what? We've done it. We're good. Um, we just are starting the grant process for a continuation year. And in general, the, the grants will be three years. Um, so you apply one year, and then you get two continuations, and then apply again. So we won't have to go out to competition again for another two years, which is great. Um, our state monitoring person, um, Robin Harris, has been wonderful. And she's really looking at this as a building year. Let's get some great foundations down so that the program will be strong and our systems will be good and our procedures will be enough to sustain us um, far into the future. We have 12 members this year serving uh, in the community. Um, the grant is for 16, but I was hired August 10th. And school started not that very long after that. So we, um, we were not able to get our full complement, which is not a ding against us at all. Um, as far as the state is concerned, they were kind of expecting that. Um, and you'll get to meet the 12 members here in just a couple minutes. I put all their names down on the bottom so you can read those. <coughs> we're serving in eight schools. That's our seven local schools and also out in Crescent, who is a partner with us. Um, and that's been a really fun uh, partnership to kind of work on. We do have other partners as well. Um, I can skip ahead. I don't want to miss anybody. We have we have some programming partners uh, who we do programs in their buildings. The YMCA, the Boys and Girls Club, the library. Um, we're working with 4-H um, down at the Lower Awa Tribe. And then we also have some funding partners, which are pretty... Um, important to what we do um, because they help to provide some of the matching funds that we work with. The Port Angeles Ed Foundation, the Watton Family, the Bishop Foundation, the Howard Foundation. Um, so all of those folks contribute to the program in general um, by supporting us with their money. We have after school programs in all of these locations. Um, Throughout the day, an AmeriCorps member will uh, support classroom activities. Uh, they ha each have about 10 to 12 students that they're seeing for a sustained amount of time um, during the year. So right now, that means about 100 kids are getting one-on-one, -on -one solid time with an AmeriCorps. And they're really targeting students that need to be kind of moved forward. Um, some of our students, you know, come into October and they're like, ah, they haven't done a single assignment yet this year. Uh, so then we put an AmeriCorps with them and they start to catch up and, and move forward. Um, and then they do the after school stuff. And that looks like a lot of different things. It gives the AmeriCorps an opportunity to bring some of their own skills into the package. Um, if you, Jefferson is going to have another play coming up soon. Um, the last one was pretty fantastic and that's Sassy that's there. We have art clubs, um, reading clubs, um, we have cooking classes. So there's a lot of fun stuff going on in addition to the academic support. We've had two program audits so far, which means that the state has come and looked at us twice and looked through all of our stuff and looked through our files and said, um, good, you're doing great. Um, they've also come to look at our finances and their goal there is to make sure that um, their $220,000 a year is going where they think it's going and that we can prove that and that we have the system behind us to be able to show that because they have to then show that up to the feds and make sure that that all goes like it's supposed to. I did put the quote up there. We have had some challenges so so far I've just told you about the highlights of things um, but I think it's important to note that there are challenges and to express how we're kind of meeting those. Um, timing for hires obviously August 10th, school starts two weeks later, that was a little bit of a challenge. Um, we will start our hiring process in April this year, um, which is when the federal website goes live and people from all over the country then will start to apply for our positions here. Um, we're kind of a coveted location, um, which if you live here, you know why. It's beautiful here. People really want to come out to the Olympic Peninsula, but it does take a little bit of effort to move and pack up your life and get out here. So we'll give them lots of time and that'll go a lot smoother this year. And then our other one is just integrating with school district systems. Um, the 
federal programming, it's the Corporation for National Community Service, has some very specific things that they need. Um, and they don't always match up with what the school district is already doing. And so working with the different departments, with our finance department, with the HR department, to make sure that we're not creating more work for them and we're still getting the work done that the CNCS needs from us. So we're working on that. We spent a lot of time talking and, you know, I'm just having a little bit of a learning curve year as well. Um, I, have to, I have to learn all the systems so that I know how to make them integrate. But it's going okay. So that is our first year in AmeriCorps. Um, and I really um, am grateful for all the work that Tina put in to make this happen, for all the work that people in the community put in and the support that she was given as she wrote the grant. Um, because without that, we wouldn't have, wouldn't have received it. And then I've had great support, um, and our members have too in their schools <coughs> since we started. Um, very, very pleased about all of that. Um, and now we're here to recognize them, and I don't know, um, Dr. Jackson, if you're going to come and say their names or if you want me to call them up, and then you I'll can... I'll shake your hand, and the board president come up there and shake your hand. Okay. And see if we can recognize them. For the and Tina said, make sure you get a picture. Yeah. I bet that's surprising to you all, right? <laughs> yeah. yeah. Tina's never asked you for pictures. No, okay, no. you have the board president passes out after you uh, okay. uh, read their name. I'll read the name. Okay. I'll hand them to you. Okay. Good job. Then you'll shake their I'll hand. Shake hand. And you guys come stand right up here, okay? <laughs> um, and you can face here and then turn and face there. Or just do a pirouette. <laughs> I want to see a dance number. Right? <laughs> and we, oh, we didn't work on the dance number, Sarah. <laughs> now, before you say their names, everyone told me what a great program this was and how we lost it, how much we missed them. So now that it's back in the school, we really want to do everything we can. Okay, so this is a real kudo to these youngsters that work with our, our kids in a support program across the district and the county and outside of our district. So. And Michelle's uh, a real organizational nut, but she is so exact in, in seeing the vision and articulating the vision. So kudos for your leadership in doing that. So thank you. Thank you. Appreciate that. So we have Cassidy Abbott. She has just joined us on a half year term and she's up at Fort Angeles High School. <coughs> Sean Butler also at Fort Angeles High School and he's been there the whole time. Um, Sean got initiated right away by the students nicknaming him Captain AmeriCorps. <laughs> Paige Reed is serving out at Roosevelt. Um, she says third graders are kind of neat. <laughs> and she's really good at long division. <laughs> Not so good at kickball. Not so good at kickball. <laughs> Ann Cohen is serving at Lincoln High School, and um, I placed her there because I knew that she would be a great advocate for those students. <laughs> Carrie Ann Campbell, dubious pleasure of serving at Stephen Middle School. This girl is always happy, so it works out really well. <laughs> Cheyenne Pope is at Hamilton. Cheyenne plans to be a teacher, and she's bringing a great amount of skill to that position. Also an art book. Machik, I'm just going to say your first name. His last name is C-V-Y-Z. You guys say it. You tell me. Sure. Sure. Machik serves at Stevens. And also gets to go to Nature Bridge because there are boys in other places, and so he gets to do all the fun stuff. Mary Jacobs is serving at Franklin, and she she's also at the Boys and Girls Club, and she's doing a cooking class, and she has a new art class, so she's heavily involved. Haley has just joined us for a half year term at Crescent, so she's serving out there for us this year. Sassy Warfield is at Jefferson, and she is the drama queen. And I don't mean that in a bad way at all. <laughs> Best way ever. Cassie White is serving at Jefferson, and Cassie has found a great niche working with the kids that um, have some special connections. And last but not least, by any means, is Kelly Whiteford, who is serving out at Dry Creek, and then also with um, the Lower Owl Tribe. So she's learning to play, well, 
there's one for Michelle. And there's one for me too. Okay, so we get you over there. And, okay. And can we get a picture? Here's my picture. Now, when we do pictures at Franklin, you're supposed to hold your choice right here. Okay, so how do you, get, how do you want to move this picture thing? Mm -hmm. You want to get the picture? Let's put the tall in the back, shorter in the front. Michelle, can we get the board president there? Oh, okay. Okay. Oh, okay. Yes, oh, yes, this will go on our web page. I'm not Tina, and we have a phone to you, so. Okay, come on, come on. How many administrators does it take to use a phone? No, just kind of standing in the window. Can you get it? We're good? All right, we're smiling. All right, ready? Over here with the little iPhone. One more, I have the whiteboard there. Okay. All right, thank you. Thank you, guys. Yeah, they can be. They're connected. Yeah, you guys. Yeah, they have a job to do tomorrow. Oh, look! I had more slides. See, let's Thank you, Michelle. Thank you for your support. Thank you. See, and there we go. Yes. Thanks, Michelle. Thank you, Michelle. Wonderful presentation. We're so glad to have everybody here. Working with our wonderful students and staff in our district. Now we move down to 6.03 Boys and Girls Club update. We have our Girls and Boys Club representative this evening to speak to us. What's left of her after today? Okay, I'm okay. I'm Mary Budke, Executive Director of the Boys and Girls Club, and Norma Turner, our co chair of our Port Angeles Unit Advisory Board, is joining me this, this afternoon. Okay. Evening. No. All right. Thank you for having us, and it's wonderful to be here. Uh, our update on Boys and Girls Club. And I wanted to start out by letting you know that we've grown 30% over last year. Our clubhouse is growing leaps and bounds, and I want you to imagine that in a fourplex. 120 kids a day in a fourplex. Our average daily attendance as it climbs is mostly elementary school children. We serve primarily four elementary schools and all are welcome to come to the Boys and Girls Club, the high school, middle school, and also homeschoolers. I mean, believe it or not. All of that for $30 a year and we're open 290 days a year in Port Angeles, 310 in Squim. You might ask what the $30 a year buys, uh, $250 a month, a latte or a month at the Boys and Girls Club. If they don't have that, they come anyway for free. We're serving a lot of children that are now in foster care. They're coming and going pretty quickly in the club up in, in where we're located on Francis Street in the Housing Authority. We have academic support, character and leadership, and healthy lifestyles. And what that means with academic support is we help with schoolwork, tutoring, and also encourage kids to turn in their homework. Addie this afternoon showed me her grades, what she's missing, and started in on her homework. We asked to see them. We provide a quiet area where they can get their work done and call in help when it's needed, especially in upper division math. Character and leadership. Don't lie. Go to school. Be there on time. Turn in your homework. It's pretty simple. Healthy lifestyles. We encourage healthy lifestyles through healthy eating habits and self-esteem programs. This afternoon at the Boys and Girls Club, if you would have walked in, Passport to Manhood was going on for the middle school age boys, teaching young boys to be good men. This is a curriculum that we pull down from our national organization that is evidence-based to be effective in um, resistance training for young boys. Uh, not to drink alcohol, drugs, how to treat uh, their partners, when they start dating with respect and dignity, to avoid sexual contact early, to delay that uh, and the onset of sexual activity, and also to bond with the community. They have community projects that they'll be fulfilling. Right now they're working with the Humane Society. And if you go to their margaritas and mutts at the end of, the, of next month, you will see those kids with dog and cat hats on. They go out in the community and raise money for other nonprofits as well and support those. I'm here to tell you a little bit about our dream. We are building a new facility 
in Port Angeles, a 14,000 square foot facility right down on Lauritsen Boulevard to serve the needs of our children. We hope to have this uh, dream completed in five years. We've talked about it for a long time, but we've actually started putting a plan together. What that means is our corporate board has already put $60,000 down for the infrastructure. The Housing Authority will be our partner. They will be leasing the dirt to us for a dollar a year, and they will be doing a lot of the preliminary work on developing the land to be built. We will apply for youth recreation funding through our state <coughs> government. We get about 25 cents to the dollar. Our cost <coughs> per square foot, we figure, is going to be about $259. We will have a, a full gym, the gym, is, gym time is premium in Port Angeles, also in Squim. And we'll have dedicated rooms for homework, for the arts, computer lab, and we do a lot of science and technology in the clubs as well. And again, we hope to be completed with this project in three to five years. We have a special <coughs> board subcommittee that is working hard to make this dream a reality. We will be receiving our funding also from writing grants, and we have those targeted grants that we have lined up, community foundations and donations. So we are well on our way to realizing that dream for Port Angeles and the kids for Port Angeles. They deserve a Boys and Girls Club. Looking forward to the summer. We will be once again doing the summer food program for all children in Port Angeles, ages 18 and under. No questions asked. They don't have to provide identification. They don't have to show meat. We will be serving in seven sites this summer, including two school district properties. One, we've been asked to serve at Roosevelt Elementary School during the month of July for the special needs summer school, and we are happy to do that. It will be an open site. Others are invited in. The second site we've been asked to serve at is uh, Lincoln. Uh, they've asked us to come in and serve. They asked us in the middle of last summer, and we said that we would be able to accommodate uh, this uh, summer of 2016, and we are moving to do that. So we will be serving seven sites. We do site prep. We do not vend, which means we don't go through, like the school district uses Sodexo to vend the meals. We do site prep. We prepare the food, and we take it out to each of the sites daily. Last year saw a 28% increase over meals served, and when I was at Dream Center, Dream Park, a little boy who picked up a lunch showed his mom the milk and said, look, mom, we get milk. It's pretty amazing, and I would encourage any of you in this room to come out, volunteer, hand a bag of food to a child and a carton of milk, and I can pretty much promise you that will make you big. Some of the things that we've done during the month of March. Port Angeles children on March 2nd not only celebrated Dr. Seuss's birthday, but they celebrated in the state's capital. They were, they left school for the day to travel to Olympia where they met Senator Hargrove and our state representatives, Steve Derringer and Kevin Vandewey. They spent a day in the capital with saw some heated floor action, saw some bills being hotly debated and were recognized from the floor and were invited down in the Senate to go ahead up behind the diocese and have their picture taken. One of the highlights of the day, besides learning how government really operates by seeing it up close and personal, is they got to go to a really nice restaurant. And if you would like the name of it, it's Red Robin. And they highly recommend it. They think it's a very nice, fancy restaurant. And so that made their day. They also were able to go to uh, the Marvel comic review in Seattle in box seats and get to see a live stage performance and this was a Friday evening of uh, the Hulk, Spider-Man and some other characters that I only know a couple of those. So we are making sure that they are getting well-rounded opportunities to go out into our community, out on our peninsula and out in our world. Smart Girls will be starting next week. The culminating trip for Smart Girls, and that's another resistance training program, is a trip to the University of Washington, where they get to go and see classes, have a tour of the campus, and be able to dream of college for them and what they're going to do with their lives. So at this point, I'd like to ask you if anybody has any questions. Norma is also here to answer anything you might want to know. And thank you for what you do for our children as well.
Mary, thank you very much for your presentation. You said that the, the proposed new building is 14,000 square feet. How many square feet are you operating in around now? Four. <clears throat> and it's a residential footprint that we're in yeah. uh, with residential bathrooms, a residential kitchen that today they had uh, whole grain rice with uh, cheese, they had chicken, fruit and milk, and a kitchen much the size of what you will go home tonight to prepare your dinner in. So we're very excited about also the community kitchen that we will be having there and the new clubhouse where you'll be able to use that and open it up to the community as we do in Squim. Anything else I can answer for you? Do you know how our, our military boy is doing? We do. Um, and thank you for asking, Sarah. Cole Tamba, last year's Youth of the Year, second in the state for Washington, a fine product of Port Angeles High School and the Boys and Girls Club. He had a great year. He went forward, competed against, there are 42 Boys and Girls Clubs in King County alone. There are 144 in our state. And Cole Tamba walked off that stage in second place. He would have won, except for they realized he was going into the Army and he couldn't represent across the state for the rest of the year. He also graduated high school, which thanks to Norma and Jean Turner, Cole was homeless the senior year. And he went to Skills USA at the high school and came away 11th in the country. That boy who'd never flown anywhere went twice in one month on an airplane, once to Atlanta, Georgia, and once, I believe, to Tennessee, where he was with um, the shop teacher to, to represent for the high school. He will be home in two weeks, finishing basic training for the U.S. Army, where he has excelled and received some accommodation, and will be stationed in California, I believe. So he's going to be home for a couple weeks, and then he's off to his new assignment. The kids ask, even today, every day, when's Cole coming back? That young man was a leader, and he showed them, you can do whatever you want to do if you work hard and if you dream. So, but thank you for asking that. Good. Cool. Please tell me you were joking. Is that the reason you didn't get first place? I really do think it was the reason. <laughs> I'm very competitive. I have to have a reason why I'm sure in. hoping that they did not discriminate against the young man because he was going into the United States. <laughs> Um, well, I believe that oh, that was one but of the... that's not the point. The point is the, that he's a fantastic young man. He is. He is. That's he a great is. And he had great support yeah. from the high school, and he had an amazing looking suit, and he was, this whole community came together and took care of Cole. And thank you for asking about him. And we have another Youth of the Year going up this year, this time from SWIM, but she's uh, a great student, and that's a wonderful scholarship program for our kids. So anything else that I can answer for you? Or anything Other than the fact you? that the two things that everyone says about the Boys and Girls Club is that everybody likes the Boys and Girls Club and no one gets turned away. So just thank you so much. For the You're very welcome. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. And Norma. And Norma. And Norma. And Norma. And Norma. Yeah. And whole board. Um, 6.04 facilities and committee report. So thank you. You know, I always get to follow the Boys and Girls Club, and that's a hard act to follow. So, um, uh, Dr. Jackson asked back in December if, if we could put a facilities group together uh, to look at the facilities um, district-wide and come up with a long-range facilities plan that would take us um, from now to the next 20 years. Uh, we've done that. I will give you the report tonight. At the last meeting, I asked if there were a couple of members that would like to uh, to present this, and uh, Steve uh, Metner and Chris Ripple uh, said that they would like to. So I'm going to let them come up here and, and uh, talk about the report. Yeah. Okay. So um, I. I'm going to start things off and then turn things over to Steve, and, and you can actually start listening when Steve starts talking. But um, I just want to say that for me, it was the a first time, or what I call my first rodeo, where I got to be a part of this facilities committee, and it was a real pleasure to work with a couple of school board members and members of the community and the, and the, the staff and faculty of our um, of our school district to sort of uh, rally around the idea that there are some real dire needs with our district and the facilities that we have. Uh, it was very interesting to learn the history. Um, we spent three of our sessions of our, I think ended up being six sessions, 
um, learning about the specific facilities that we have and traveling to different facilities and um, really starting to get or gather the data that we need to really develop a, a, a plan or, or an idea about what we would recommend to this school board for action. Um, and then in the last couple of, or I guess it ended up being, we had two and then we scheduled the third, but uh, we ended up having time to really discuss and debate the different things that uh, that we all gleaned from the presentations that were made about the district. And uh, Steve is going to present some of the, the things that we have uh, for recommendations for this board to consider. Uh, but before we get there, I want to specifically and, and particularly note that Nolan Deuce uh, really went above and beyond in his uh, preparation for and presentations during these meetings. Uh, he was really prepared, presented some uh, amazing detail and data uh, and uh, and I, I think did it in, a, in an objective way. He's got, you know, Nolan has an agenda. He does this stuff and he sees, I think, from more than anybody probably in this room, the needs that we have for our children. Uh, but in light of all of that, he was able to present things in a very objective way. And I uh, personally commend him and thank him for the level of detail and commitment he has. And I think certainly both this board and the, and the audience in the district really owe him a, a debt of gratitude for his time. So. I could not second that more heartily. Uh, Nolan, uh, Nolan puts his heart and soul into this, and uh, uh, thank you, Chris. That that was appropriate and uh, and uh, well said. Um, my name is Steve Methner. I was part of the the uh, Long Range Facilities Task Force in 2013 and 2014. Part of the uh, Capital Facilities Committee in 2014, uh, and uh, then part of the uh, morning. Um, uh, the, the mourners um, who went into hibernation for a little while um, and uh, but uh, but appropriately so it's it's time to start thinking about this again and I'm, I'm kind of terrified but excited it's kind of like thinking about having a baby um, <laughs> it feels about the same way uh, this time so uh, but the committee was made up of uh, Nolan uh, Dr. Jackson Chuck Lisk uh, Michelle Olson Amity Butler, Steve Zenovic, Steve Methner, uh, Karen Ross, Jared Blauser, uh, Scott Harker, David uh, Knechtel, uh, Chris Riffle, uh, Barry Burnett, uh, Susan uh, Schottenhafer, and uh, Josh Jones. Um, Joshua Jones, sorry, Dr. Jones. Oh, I'll, I'll answer. Yeah, yeah just, 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 it's, just keep talking. It's going to be Josh. Uh, but uh, the, uh, the basis of our recommendations uh, were, were gleaned from uh, multiple architectural engineering reports from 2007, uh, 2008, 2014, and then uh, superintendent, Office of Superintendent of Public Instruction reports uh, from prior to those times that had evaluated the schools kind of on a zero to 100 basis. Um, and, uh, and so the, uh, the, the re our, our meetings, there were only five scheduled. We ended up with six, so we tried to go fairly quickly and not try to recreate wheels that had already been created. Um, and to let you know, the, the, the guiding principles that we used, I'll highlight just a few of the most important ones in my mind. The, the first one is kids come first. We need to hold student success as the number one priority. Uh, the second one, and this was part of the learning of the failure of the first one, is we need to be responsive to the local community. Um, uh, another one that's, that really stands out is that a, a configuration must meet the criteria of simplicity, of fairness, of transparency, and acceptability to most. Uh, we know there's never going to come a time when everybody is all completely in lockstep. Um, but, uh, uh, and then, uh, uh, a new school configuration must account for current demographics, uh, for flexibility in the future, and of course for fiscal responsibility. Um, and our goal was to prioritize the needs and the potential solutions to determine the scope with the most value, uh, the best learning environment, and to make a recommendation to you folks. So uh, one of the things I'd like to stress is that we felt like the process uh, going forward for whatever happens going forward, we felt like the process with the community not just with this effort, but with all efforts forever going forward was something that should be kept in mind. And so we don't have a, we do this big thing now and then what's next kind of question that looms out there in the community that we're able to say that this is a coherently thought out thing that is repeatable sort of indefinitely. Um, and, and I think there is a mathematical uh, way to do that. So. With that, uh, the highlights of the plan, and I think you have it in front of you, 
uh, and it's posted here as well. Um, so I sort of went through what, what our guiding principles uh, are, but, uh, but value kept coming up over and over. Um, we, need to see, we need to see value for whatever happens. Um, and uh, in all instances, the high school figured fairly prominently uh, for a number of reasons, uh, but uh, the most of which is that it's well past its design life uh, and in dire need of, uh, of help. So, uh, but we must also recognize, and this is the huge counterforce, is that we are, we're facing some critical systems failures at two of our elementary schools in particular, uh, as well as an impending mandate for lower class sizes. Uh, which is going to put space pressure um, all over the place. So um, in light of the failure of the 2015 measure, uh, we wanted to balance the urgent need for uh, rehab or new facilities um, with the very short remaining service life of, of two of our elementary schools and to do so in a way that's both predictable and supportable for taxpayers. So. Um, while the 2015 bond measure um, was close to a simple majority, we felt like it's very unlikely that it's going to see uh, uh, in uh, soon enough to meet our needs uh, acceptance by a supermajority, which is that's what we have to operate under, uh, is the idea that we will require a supermajority for the indefinite future. So the other thing about it was that the, the 2015 measure did require so much of our capacity. Uh, that it really would have let, left us honestly very little room to do a lot of planning going forward. So, um, so it it may be, and this is just me speaking. It may be an okay thing that uh, that uh, we had to take a, a second shot at this because it does force us to think sort of more permanently about what we're going to do on an ongoing basis about facilities. So, um, the specific recommendations. Uh, the first one, rather than a, an entire school replacement, uh, we scale it way back. Uh, we are going to need uh, additional science and technology classroom space at the high school that we just don't physically have ca uh, capability uh, for at the moment. Um, but uh, we also have some aging buildings that will continue to cost a lot of money. Uh, and so the recommendation is to replace either the 100 and 900 buildings or just the 100 building uh, with a modern building that would be uh, much more efficient to run, much easier to secure from a security standpoint. Uh, and also give the community something that they can see uh, as value for the dollar and see as progress because a big part of what happens with this needs to be how the community feels because an economy is not based on uh, bean counting. An economy is based on how people feel about where they are. They spend money, they come, they move based on what they see in schools and parks and community involvement um, and, uh, and how, they, how they feel about the place that they're going. Um, is usually the, the primary driver because they can make all the other stuff work usually. Um, so having a, 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 a replaced building at the high school is a very important iconic issue as well. Um, uh, concurrently to that, update Stevens Middle School to accommodate moving all the sixth grade classes to that campus. Uh, this will involve expanding the cafeteria, the kitchen, uh, the music and gym areas and adding a permanent classroom building probably not attached to the main building. Uh, and third, uh, either from the capital projects budget over the next several, several years or as part of this bond measure, um, allocation of approximately $500,000 to prevent the critical systems failures that we know are coming at uh, Franklin and Hamilton um, during phase one of this long-term plan. So uh, roofs, heating systems, uh, carpets, windows, you know, all that stuff that, that has to just, it, it, it can't happen without that water, that sort of stuff. A um, uh, big asterisk here, as an alternative, uh, the district can consider replacing only the 100 building, um, which would be about 16,000 fewer square feet uh, of new construction, and that would reduce the size of a bond measure. Um, or we could reevaluate the deficiency assessments that have been done to see if uh, it might make more sense than we have thought uh, originally to, uh, to rehabilitate the buildings that exist. Um, so, but to keep an open mind about all those uh, alternatives. Um, the rationale for this, uh, moving the sixth grade to the middle school allows us to stay in our current footprint and doesn't require the cost uh, or uh, duplication of opening or reopening a new facility. Um, so there are arguments uh, about whether we should uh, use in some of our existing facilities versus, uh, uh, versus stay in our current footprint. But from an efficiency standpoint, it, uh, it would seem that staying in our current footprint would make a lot of sense. Uh, uh, newer modern, <coughs> and there's a lot of bus routes, 
additional staffing, additional janitorial, all that stuff that goes with going into an additional facility. So uh, newer modernized facilities, uh, and we found this in surveying, uh, that efficiency and safety um, uh, are, are key issues for people. Uh, newer modernized facilities certainly would be much easier to design for safety and also to design for efficiency. Um, uh, and when the citizens group did polling, they found those were two uh, primary issues uh, for people were, were efficiency and safety. Uh, <clears throat> I talked a little bit about the, uh, the, the high school already. So in terms of future phases, we recommend uh, in phase two in approximately 10 years that we, uh, uh, that we work to pay down any uh, existing debt as quickly as possible. And then in, in approximately 10 years, uh, we, we uh, look at a facility, at a, at a, a revenue event, another bond or whatever it takes uh, to continue updating and replacing, uh, continuing updating at the high school and uh, uh, replacement or major modernization of Franklin. Uh, phase three, approximately 20 years out, we would continue updating uh, and or remodeling of the high school and, uh, and then work on replacement or major modernization of Hamilton. Those, of course, are interchangeable depending on what the physical reality of those schools are. One might, they may, neither of them or both of them might actually last long enough to, to allow that to happen. So, yeah. <laughs> so, but we have, we have to work within what we have available to us. So, um, the process we thought was one of the most critical parts of this though, um, as much or more important than the physical recommendations, uh, because voters must see clear value in what's going on and feel that the district is acting responsibly. Um, and we felt that it was pretty important to conduct any, any future efforts with a couple of things in mind. State assistance funds, if they are received, uh, our recommendation would be to apply them to the bond principle. There are technicalities around that. You'll have experts to help you figure out what that, what that looks like. But that they be returned to the taxpayer, basically, in one form or another. Um, and there are, are, are mechanical ways where that would allow you to really accelerate your ability to pay down the bond issue so you are ready um, for phase two in 10 to 12 years. So that's the way that you would be able to be ready in a short time period is to actually to pay down um, debt as quickly as possible, of course. Um, and, uh, and then every 10 or 12 years after that, you theoretically would be able to continue piece by piece to work on the district and have that be something that is indefinite in nature because we have an indefinite need, we always will. Time will continue to march on and, and uh, eat away at, at facilities. Um, number two, any and all reasonable and high quality permanent construction methods should be honestly considered where appropriate, including site built, including modular, uh, or combinations of the two where it's appropriate. Um, and uh, third, the district should enter into the bond with a long-term multi-decade perspective. The voters ask a very appropriate question. If we do this big thing now, what's your plan for the middle, for the schools that are falling apart? And I think they wisely asked that question. And as I said before, it forced us to reconsider this issue. Um, and I think it was a reasonable thing for people to be concerned about. So, um, so I, I think the district should enter into any uh, plan with a long-term, multi-decade perspective. That this is a, this is the tax burden that everybody finds acceptable and this is something we're going to try to do for the rest of all of our lives uh, or until this district doesn't exist anymore because facilities will always, 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 always continue to be a need and an issue um, and education will continue to change and this will allow us to have a routine basically that we would be able to be in um, uh, every decade or so. Uh, where people wouldn't be asked for a higher rate per thousand necessarily, where you could come back and say, this is the rate per thousand, this is not an increase to your current rate, um, so how about we renew this thing? Um, which tends to be, those tend to be the magic words uh, when you succeed are, this is not an increase to your current taxes. Those, those tend to be really important words. So uh, wherever we can try to fit within that, um, I think we should do it. So do you have any questions for the, uh, for the three of us? I think you did really wonderful work on the sure. committee. I'm um, very much. Um, the only thing I, of course, being part of the fitness nutrition committee, um, we have a mandate that we need to have 150 hours of minutes of PE a week for kids. So that'd be something I would want to roll into that. Since we're not meeting that, we're making about 80 minutes now. 
doctor student, so that would be something else. But it's kind of part of that whole gym thing. We need to, because we have not done that, and we know that long-term effects with children, obesity, all the other things that come as we get older, would have been prevented if we would have done a better job of giving more for the foot. In included in the general cost per foot, you know, we sort of spitballed on uh, how to make recommendations. Uh, but included in our in the general cost per foot was the soup to nuts idea of a school improvement, including site improvements, which might include the gym space or the outdoor facilities necessary to meet that mandate. Mm -hmm. uh, but you know, without knowing specifically what the costs are, it's hard to say. But yes, that definitely is something that's yeah. that's contemplated. This, oh, Sandy, please. Go. No, please. Go. Okay. Uh, dates and amounts. Um, I would, we purposefully did not uh, set an amount in here because we don't really know what the price tag would be until we get some expert input on that. Um, it would be substantially less than the prior uh, bond uh, measure uh, for sure. Um, and uh, date wise, um, yeah, also it would be up to your discretion of course, but, uh, but I would think that you would need a, a, you know, many months of expert evaluation to come up with uh, you know, uh, uh, the broad strokes of a proposal that actually had numbers attached to it. Um, I, <clears throat> it would be difficult, I think, to, cons to think about running it sometime this year. It would probably need to be sometime next year uh, to give the, the citizens group enough time to do the, uh, the citizen stuff and also to give the district enough time to do the, the groundwork. So this building up in, um, at Stevens, and all this is probably your, um, how many, if you were to add, bring the sixth grade up, how many classrooms are we talking? Uh, when I talked with, uh, with Chuck Lisk um, and Renee, uh, there's going to have to be at least one addition to the music department. Mm -hmm. So we're, we're going to need a classroom added on to that. Um, and I think that there was an additional 17 classrooms that it takes to bring the 400 kids up. When I asked when we were meeting, and I don't remember if we ever came up to an agreement, but how many rooms there would be left by moving the sixth grade to the middle school? What would that leave at each of the elementary schools? And I don't know that we ever. I don't. That I question. don't think we did, but um, I could get you that information. I know that there's going to be several at each uh, at each building. In fact, I I took a lot of the numbers off what. Uh, what David Connectel presented January 4th, and he had his enrollment data and just did the math of, of 17 or less, K to three, and how many classrooms it take to do that. So each of the buildings did have several classrooms that would free up by moving the, the uh, sixth graders out. And if I recall too, there are spaces that are required at the elementary schools because sixth grade is there, because the music program is there, and there are certain sixth grade uh, programs that are provided there. And those spaces wouldn't be needed in the same way, and so they could be used as classroom space or additional space as well. So you could subdivide some of the big spaces that are there um, to help with that capacity. That's exactly issue. it. Yep. Any other questions? Yeah. Thank you very much for all the work in the committee. Thank you. Now we're down to 6.05, assessment prevention, assessment prevention work report. Why not? So, preservation. APP is what, uh, APP is what, this goes by. So, um, back in the early 90s, all the schools uh, in the state uh, were told that they have to be designed to last 30 years. Prior to the early 90s, a building was designed um, not designed. You couldn't go at back and ask for state assistance for the building that was less than 20 years old. So in the early 90s, they said that's now 30 years old, and they had what was called the 2% rule, where you had to prove that you were spending 2% on the school every year to be eligible for funds, maximum funds, when you went to renew the building. So they realized that didn't work, and the bookkeeping with it was was not happening. So uh, the state moved to this asset preservation program. Um, one of the things with it is the state has given you guidelines that it, your building in 30 years has to meet a score of 62 on their scoring. And every six years they bring in somebody to uh, assess the district so it's an outside third party so you can see where you're at. Uh, every year I have to present to the board um, before April 1st. So this is a presentation. 
we want to go to the next one. So, um, so you can see Jefferson and, and Dry Creek are actually doing really well for their age. Um, Jefferson is, uh, is 12 years old and it is scoring a 90.12 90, um, 90 on the, the scoring, which actually puts it at a building that's around nine years old. So it, we're right in the ballpark. Um, a few years ago, we had a, uh, a certified assessment come in and do it. Um, I think I grade it harder than they did. So their, their scores were higher than my scores, but uh, this year were my scores. Um, as far as, as Jefferson this year, there was a couple of building categories that went down. Um, one of the building categories was uh, HVAC systems, and part of that is um, it has a lot of earlier wireless controls that aren't doing the best. And, uh, that was the only that was the only part at, at Jefferson that went down. So currently, their score is a 90.12 at Dry Creek, which is one that I really like. Um, and I like Jefferson as well, but, but Dry Creek was a, it's a bigger building. It's a building that was, um, was really built. Uh, the classrooms are a little bit bigger. Um, everything about Jefferson, Dry Creek was done well. And it's scoring 89.27 and it is 19 years old. So again, on the scale that the state has us looking at. Um, I have it here somewhere. So um, it's scoring about a building that's 11 years old instead of 19. So we did go down in three categories at, at Dry Creek this year. Um, one of the class, one of the categories was exterior doors and grills. After 20 years, you start getting a little bit of rust fading out. Uh, some of the doors are starting to leak a little bit of air. Um, we also went down in uh, uh, movable furnishings, which are their operable walls. Uh, that, that are out there. We've got one that's not working real well. And um, the last thing was wall finishes. After 20 years, we've got a few holes here and there. We did go up though. Uh, last summer, we put a new control system in for the uh, for the HVAC. And so we, we scored a little bit higher on that and it made our scores from last year to this year almost exactly the same. So we are putting money into the building. We are keeping it up. Uh, it's just, again, getting to be 20 years old. Any questions? I guess I just make a comment that often the, the what we hear out there is they're not maintaining the buildings. And these these numbers right here are actual proof that you are maintaining our buildings better than even the state requires us to maintain our buildings. And I really appreciate, and I would love for you to share that with your maintenance folks. I appreciate how hard they are working despite the fact that they were cut down to the bone in the middle of the 2000s and our numbers are still that high. So um, you guys are doing fantastic more. work, really. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Now we move down to 6.06, legislative report. Oh, that is I. All right, so. Oh, it's right here in front of me because I'm that kind of uh, organized person. So I did my report. Um, I wasn't really um, sure how you had asked for this. So and now I'm throwing things. So, I'm gonna so um, the cutoff date for uh, bills was the 4th of March, which meant at that point it needed to have been heard in the opposite house. Okay. Um, so, but the actual drop deadline is tonight at midnight. And if they haven't been heard, they're dead. Okay? Um, so, but unless, I have to make this here, unless they're necessary to implement the budget. They call it the NTIB. So, unless it is necessary to implement the budget, it has to be, it has to be done by midnight tonight. Um, if you want to look at the different budgets, the Houses and the Senates, Next to each other is an interactive one. It's on fiscal.wa.gov. And it's an interactive way to look at all the, at, at both budgets and how they differ. Fiscal.wa.gov. Um, there will give you summaries from all the agencies as to why they want that in their budget and things of that nature. Um, so the budget differences between the House and the Senate are about a half a billion dollars. 
not chump change. Uh, the House um, is approaching its budget um, to, for us to access what's called the Budget Stabilization Act, or um, account, I should say, and that's to close, uh, and to close tax loopholes. That's their plan, is we're gonna go get this money that's in our rainy day fund, and we're gonna close a bunch of loopholes, and that's how we're gonna make, find our money. Uh, the Senate's approach is uh, we need to have less new spending. Um, they want to reduce the maintenance funding that's happening uh, across the state. And um, they want a pension merger proposal. This one is this one is a non-starter in the House. Um, basically what they want, it, the firefighters and the police have a pension fund that is in really good shape. Teachers is not in quite as good shape. And um, so the Senate wants to merge those two. And the firefighters and police are not happy at all. So that's the Senate approach. Um, so in addition, okay, so finding the money, these were the four things, the four issues that were remaining. This levy cliff. This is a big, hairy deal. It's not for us, fortunately, but for all the districts that up their levy to 28%, because the legislature allowed us that year, they cut us in the middle of the year, they allowed us to go up to 28%. Our district chose not to. So, um, but the districts who did choose to, now they're saying you have to scale back to uh, 2008. Was it eight? No. Yeah, it was eight. It was nine or nine that they did that. You have to scale back to the 24%, which is a pretty big deal for people, so they'll have to start sending out RIF notices. Um, so that's one of the issues. The levy clip was what, I'm just put it in terms of, the Democrats wanted that fixed for a one-year fix. The Republicans are really um, wanting the charter schools. And they were holding hostage to the levy clip in order to get charter schools fixed. Charter schools were fixed today. After <laughs> I did my whole report, I'm going through again just to check what did I miss. Charter schools were fixed today. That was a $6.6 .6 million fix. Uh, the money is now for charter schools. They hope that the, the Supreme Court will be such that they, if the monies are not going to come out of the um, education funding. They're going to come out of um, lottery monies. And it, um, So we'll see. The others were the teacher shortage crisis and our graduation requirement fixes. Again, we have two, the House for um, graduation requirements. The House budget wants to eliminate some of our graduation requirements, um, including the collection of evidence. This does affect us. Collection of evidence is a very expensive way to get kids to graduate. Um, yet, it, if, if you have all of these <laughs> requirements and kids don't pass their end of course bio or whatever it is, they can send in their collection of evidence, and um, once they pass that, and at Lincoln High School particularly, we have a very high rate of kids passing with that collection of evidence. So eliminating it is, is going to hurt some of our kids. But um, to sort of mitigate that, they're also going to eliminate the end of course biology exam. Okay. So, um, and so the first uh, bill of the session was signed not long ago. And guess what they did? They created a task force, hot dog, so they can study McCleary and how to make McCleary work. So that's fun. Um, everybody agreed with that. Let's get some, let's have a meeting. Okay. Um, and the, the theory is that this is going to go into extra innings because the legislature can do one of two things right now. They can just say, fine, we've got it up by any by ending a budget already in place. So they don't have to do a supplemental. They don't do a supplemental, however. We had these big sort of like, I don't know, what do they call those? Oh, fires last year. Big, huge fires. And that is, that is going to need to be handled, paying for that and going forward if we have that again. Um, so they need to, um, they're going to need a supplemental budget. So nobody believes that they're going to retire without getting a supplemental budget. Um, they also would not be able to deal with the mental health issues if they don't do a supplemental budget. But the Supreme Court kind of said, we're not doing what we kind of have to do. So, I want to give you all, you have your pens. Yes. Okay. I want to give you these things, how to stay connected with all legislative things. If you go on the WASDA website, www.wasda.com, I know, nobody says the www anymore. Okay, you, there's a tab, it's called the legislative tab. You click on that. There is going to be legislative updates. If you read all through the legislative updates and you go all the way to the bottom, there is something that uh, it says, stay connected. It has links. You can hit on the TVW link. 
So TVW Link is a fantastic way to see what people are talking about, how they are um, uh, talking to the legislators on the different committees. The TVW, you want to go see that. And you can even go back and see what they talked about a week ago, a month ago. Very good. Uh, and then there's a uh, bill tracking. There's another button, you just push it and it'll, you can tell them, I'm interested in this bill. And it will keep sending you updates as that bill is moving through. Um, and again, fiscal.wa.gov, very important website. And all those links are on the WASDA website. So I hope that gave you kind of an overview of what's going yes. on in the legislature. And thank you. And I did go to WASDA uh, this past week. And did it help you a lot? Right? Oh, it did. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Good. Absolutely. So you are in New York. No, I just had to search and search for it, but I found it once I found it. Okay, good. But, it's a very good but I didn't read it today, and okay. obviously, it you didn't read it every me when day. I read that. And I thought, wow, well, there was half my report. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Thank you. You, you did a very good job, and I appreciate it. I tried to talk real fast. You did very good. Thank and you. I think also on Friday notes, we're doing the um, weeks, whatever it is, seven update, generally yep. including that. So, mm -hmm. and you can go to that, and then have some tabs there you can click, which is really helpful. So, uh, the total compensation for teachers at the state level, uh, the Supreme Court is, is basically putting pressure on the House and the Senate to either come up with the funding to cover the total cost, basic cost of education, and no one really knows what that is, but also to deal with the total compensation piece from the teachers because they haven't had a raise or a cost of living. So they got a cost of living. Yeah. yeah. Last year. Yeah. yeah. So, so I guess uh, the, you have the levy cliff on one hand, saying a lot of the money that uh, is being appropriated through levies has been appropriated, but goes to <coughs> teacher salaries. Just basically. Uh, yeah. In, yeah. In those districts that are 28, ever in some of the bigger ones, would really be in trouble if. The Supreme Court said can't do that anymore, and they have to put in layoff notices. And then, on the other hand, uh, the total compensation package—they they don't have enough revenue inside the budget to help mitigate the cost of giving teachers a fair minimum wage. So there's they're caught between a rock and a hard place because there's people in Olympia that say we're not going to raise taxes to get this. So. Everyone's just kicking this down. The road. And they have until 17th. Yes. Um, that's what the Supreme Court, but the Supreme Court has required. As soon as a budget gets signed, a supplemental budget is signed by the governor, he has 30 days. Yes. The state has 30, the legislature has 30 days to go in front of the Supreme Court and say, these are the steps we have taken yes. to move us down that path. Right. And they're hopeful that just putting together a task force is going to be enough to satisfy oh. the Supreme Court. I don't know. I am not on the Supreme Court. Um, it's really actually very fascinating. We are watching history being made. We're watching two branches of government going head to head. On it's it's, it's very fascinating time to, to watch. Thank you, sir, for so. the report. Thank you. Yes, thank you, sir. Okay. Uh, so now we have moved down to six point oh seven. The board school improvement. And I, I really, really brought this up because we touched base with this during the course of the school year, and uh, I didn't want to belabor the whole thing, but I just wanted to draw your attention to page six in our action plan on organizational culture. Uh, what our plan under action item three was communicate by work by personally visiting assigned school sites and departments through visitations, and we are doing that. We, uh, thank you so much for your support. Uh, feedback that I get from the science is that they're really glad to see the board at the sites and visit the classrooms and visit the, the teachers, and visit the administrators. Uh, they're excited about that. And I, I feel that when you are in the schools, you, you can see the money that you appropriate for uh, in education, for the sites. And that's big. That's a, that's a big thing. Um, also, um, the, on page eight, one of the actions under organizational culture was also to 
increase the outreach to students and determine what students are interested in participating in barriers to or participation in clubs. Uh, and we know that many of our students are actively engaged in each of the schools, especially at the high school. And we have a great turnout of youngsters in sports and in programs at the high school as well as at the middle school. Uh, and we're evaluating the involvement uh, but through the participation for Skyward. So we, we have an activities director, a sports director, and he has that data and will continue to provide the board with that data as we look at our action plan uh, that we'll bring back at a later time. The uh, page nine, TPAP, Barry's in the audience, and we continue to work with the union and uh, train teachers and staff so that uh, they are getting the staff development that they need to help teachers and, and to provide the support <coughs> that they need and yet approach assessment and uh, academic achievement in each of the classrooms uh, so that people are evaluated fairly. It's not a, a gotcha game, but <coughs> one of staff development so that uh, people are following the basic models of the Danielson model as we train throughout our district. Um, in our action plan under goal three, which is resources, um, tonight was, uh, there was a presentation on facilities. David right now is, is also talking about our budgetary project uh, process, so we're looking at a budget advisory committee, and he's putting together staff to look at the budget process and start to begin that process for 1670. And that will that will be happening quickly here, and we want to keep the board in that loop as we, we start our budget process for next year. The Page 12, the resources again under action item 2 was to review and evaluate all district facilities. I know you keep hearing three words, facilities, facilities, and facilities, but it's, uh, it's, it's, it's a big <coughs> issue in our schools. Uh, we have to assess, we have to find out where we want to go with that. And later this evening, under action items, Nolan will present to you some, uh, some phases of our phase two and phase three, where the board had appropriated funds in the capital projects that we have to improve on these capital projects, approve them, just right now before summer starts, because there will be roofing issues at the gym, at the high school, there will be roofing issues at Hamilton, and these are big cost items, but in order for him to secure those bids, he has to go out and get that right now. Um, the, uh, page 16, uh, one of the things that, that goes by the community of Pira, uh, just a real strong support to the board for continuing with our 20 year relationship with Mitsu in Japan. Uh, the board has appropriated the appropriate funds. Uh, we're seeing, uh, we saw students come visit us and we continue to uh, foster that good working plan with uh, our city and county organizations in this partnership with the district as we learn from each other uh, in our plan, which is in our plan. So uh, that's just kind of a highlighted areas. I didn't really want to go into detail, but I, I wanted to keep you abreast of some of those action plans that we talked about earlier in October. Any questions? Thank you. Thank you so much. Now we go on to 7.01, distribution of correspondence. Jenny? Um, there was a Washington State Auditor's Office logo and this communication magazine and email received on March 6th from a committee member. So you each have a copy of the um, um, memo we got, or the email we got. And I know that Mark has been working with a group of you know, just a little update about what you've been doing? Yes, uh, I've had ongoing conversations with uh, the three gentlemen that visited us on uh, 
especially on transgender issues. And we've had conversations uh, through email. They also come to my office and, and I talk with them. Uh, I do know that uh, transgender is a protected group under our policy, under the Office of Civil Rights. And federal law trumps lower court cases. And across the country, there are some groups that are protesting uh, this movement. But really, uh, in the state of Washington, as in the state of California, uh, they have moved in the direction of providing a protected class. And uh, in our policy regarding discrimination, we cannot discriminate against any group. But because they are a protected class, we have a process in place to deal with this. And uh, we're going to follow those policies, as we should, and deal with it accordingly. But we also listen to our constituents and, and, and let them know that we're going to try to move through this in such a way where we learn from each other and listen to each other without making people feel uncomfortable about what we're doing. So as we had our board workshop last week, we talked a little bit about protocols and stuff. So I kind of just wanted to read for the record what I sent to um, Ms. Bill. Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. So anyway, and then also for us to have a conversation about it, because you know, we talked last week about protocols, and so kind of protocols, what I would see us doing is that we would get an email, but next time we meet in public, we would discuss the email and talk about the response we do. So what I wrote to him, I said, hello, Bill, thank you very much for your email dated March 6, 2016. I want to apologize for not responding to your emails. As you can tell from our board work session last week, the board of directors and superintendent Jackson are moving forward with protocols. I have been on the school board for 15 years. We now have three new board of directors joining Director Mather and myself. We need to revisit our board policies as you witnessed at our work session so we can move forward as a new board. You will probably see the pol policy series 1,000 changes along with other policies and procedures. The board of directors will discuss your email this evening at our regular scheduled board meeting to be held at our central services building starting at 7 o'clock p.m. as this will be our first opportunity for us to, together to discuss uh, together as a board your email. As the president of the board, I value my fellow board of directors' opinion and input to all correspondence addressed to the board of directors, along with input from Superintendent Jackson. I look forward to your continued input and attendance at our school board meetings and events. Cindy Kelly, President. So, Cindy. I'd like to say to, to respond that I did not receive this email until tonight, right before this meeting started. Okay. And the only way I received it was Sarah emailed it to me. Okay. So I was, for some reason, I did not get it, and it, it seemed to indicate that we're not responding, but I did not receive it until okay. tonight, before, right, as this meeting yes. started. Yes, and I can corroborate, I looked at her email um, thing, but her email was correct on Mr. Yucca's, Yucca, I'm not sure, um, yeah. on his email list, so um, she didn't receive it. But I will say it's policy 1220, perhaps, that you are the only one who is supposed to speak mm -hmm. for the board. So, um, if we do all get emails to us, I, I personally, the uh, only way I would deal with them would be to say, this is not my position to speak for the board. You get that distinct honor, oh, Cindy. Yes. <laughs> yeah, I, 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 I agree with that. So, when we get an email that's sent to all five of us, I, I agree, it's, uh, that is a board-directed email. Because it's problematic if we're all sending out, well, Responses. this is what I think, and this is what I think, and this is what I think, then that just sends out a terrible message to the public. But yeah, and it's not to be non-responsive or to hide behind any kind of policy. It's literally to be able to get the work of the board done in a systematic fashion to actually respond more appropriately and more consistently, in my mind, as a board, um, as opposed to, you know, five fingers. Which and I thought that was one of the more interesting things that Patty Wood brought up in our workshop, which is the purpose of a board meeting, which is to do the business of the board. Um, I thought that was a very interesting comment that she made there. I hadn't really thought about it in that way, honestly. And I know we all love, we all like transparency and we really um, value when we get input, because I value that very much in having that two-way conversation. So I just think it's 
you know, very important to respond to people, and but I really do want to get the input from the board regarding before I do response. And I, it's a little bit different than what we've done in years past. It used to be the superintendent would respond to the emails. Mm -hmm. Some of that we've kind of come. We're working on our protocols. So we'll work for, to do that. Yeah, I mean, it's also it's also something we have to process in the <coughs> meeting so as to not run afoul of the meeting rules, <coughs> which are extraordinarily important to all of us. So. Absolutely. And I want to be sure the public understands that, um, because I'm new on the board, I'm just beginning <coughs> to learn things, right. that we can't be together, that we don't, that more than two of us cannot be together in, in, in events, so we can't really talk about any of this until we're all together. Right. Um, so. I, I think that's something that I didn't understand until I came on the board. And I want to be sure the public understands that that we can't chit and chat about things like this until we come together as as a group mm -hmm. because it has to be done in public. But thank you very much. And then this is kind of how we'll be handling the email. You know, Jenny will just pass them out at the. We'll probably have all preceded, but we'll be here to discuss the emails. So let me be real sure. Okay. We're not going to reply to these. That's correct. Okay, that's what I want to be very. I want to. I, that is, it, so if he will get a. Get so a I response. read what I. Was yeah, asking. I saw that. Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm, I want to be if you want more detail, sure that he I'm understands good. why I am not responding yes. to him personally. Okay. So now we move down to community comments <clears throat> for non-agenda items. So we have um, a few individuals who would like to speak, but they are about agenda items. But at this uh, point, we've talked about facilities. So, um, John, um, Jim has, and you have three minutes. That's um, and Josh will be timing you. Okay. Hi, uh, Jim Preston. I live at 3002 South Maple Street in Port Angeles. Uh, thank you for letting me talk this evening. Um, <clears throat> I was happy to hear uh, some of the comments about facilities and what the plans are. I noted that the school bond was defeated last November, and today we have a report being given to us uh, four months later, and I appreciate the information was given, but um, I don't have a copy to read. The speaking was very fast, it was very general, and in all honesty, I didn't follow it entirely. Um, my profession has been commercial real estate for over 30 years. Um, I did hear your comment about the repairs that are being done to extend the life of buildings. Yes, your schools are doing that, but again, in commercial real estate, it's critical that you do the repairs. You don't throw away commercial buildings. In commercial real estate, if you have functional obsolescence, then you may tear it down and replace it, or if a neighborhood completely changes. Otherwise, you repair it and repair it and repair it. Um, and I just want to say that there are a number of commercial firms out there that are experts in coming in and evaluating buildings to determine what repairs are necessary to put together a schedule of maintenance, a schedule of replacement uh, for five years out, ten years out. Have you used any of those? I heard comments that there were engineering studies from 2007 that were reviewed, other older studies that were reviewed. What is actually current that you're looking at? You know, each building needs to be looked at by people who know what they're doing. And this is their lifeblood to come in and evaluate the HVAC, the electrical, structural condition, everything else. And then you can see what's needed for repairs and then what would have to be torn down. Uh, if a building or if a facility doesn't have the proper science buildings or something like that, you might have to build something new. But before any new construction is done, please evaluate carefully what you have and how you can extend the life. Um, and I do applaud the idea, I believe that's out there, to have all the sixth graders in one area to try to free up some classrooms. So it sounds like you're going about it the right way, but I just suggest use real experts out there to find out how you can extend the life of the buildings. Thank you. Can I just really quickly, Mr. Preston, all of the um, studies are on our website. If you go down and look, they're all available. Everything that we have ever done, all of the meetings and everything. I know I'm not supposed to engage, but I did want you to know that it's all out there for free. Okay. So uh, have so, fun. So just generally, 
Yeah. 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 Everyone. Yeah. For everyone. It is absolutely there to look up all the different studies that have come out. And also when you join us at the meeting, there's a book back there that has all the documents. So if you haven't had a chance to read, you can pick up the book back there and it has all the documents of what we will be presenting tonight. But everything gets posted on Monday of the board, the week of the board meeting. So you're welcome to go look at all the stuff that we're looking at. So it's out there for you to read it before you come to the board. Stephanie. Oh boy. <laughs> Stephanie Owen, 2345 East 3rd Avenue. I liked what Mr. Preston was saying because that's where my head was tonight about having somebody independent. But it was mentioned in the report that there's certified assessments. Is that an independent assessment? For, I, I wrote that down. Um, okay, I don't, know what, I don't know what to say about that. And then um, a couple other questions. Um, is there any consideration about reopening Fairview? <coughs> we have a facility. We have, w would it be a lot to bring that up to speed and use that instead of building lots and lots of extra classrooms? I ask, ask you to look into that one. And then after this report we had tonight, what's the next steps? So I have questions. Thanks. Thank you very Mark, you got those written. I do. Thank you. Now we move down to Board of Directors comments. Excuse me, Cindy. I'm sorry, I had your late and I didn't get a chance to sign up. Can I? Okay, Dale. Thank you very much. <coughs> Hi, my name is Dale Wilson. I live at, uh, on uh, 4th Street here in Port Angeles. Uh, I came here, first of all, to thank all of the new board members and thank you so much for your vision for our future and taking the time out of your lives to, to be on this school board because, as you all know, the children are our future. Second thing I want to do is uh, just tell you how excited I am to see the changes and the enthusiasm and the excitement that's going on at the skill center now. I think that the, the I, I go there a lot because I have friends that are on the second floor at the EDC and at the college and I've never seen so much enthusiasm and excitement and laughter and just really uh, kids enjoying the learning process and I think a lot of credit goes to the skill center director here Jody but it's just uh, I think it has, you know starts from the top and I think it's, it, it comes down from all of you and from uh, Mark as well. Uh, third thing is uh, as all of you know, I hope you know by now that PAPA, the Peninsula Area Public Access, is going to be online or, or on the channel, we hope, by May 1st. <coughs> and we're so excited that, that uh, Dr. Jackson has agreed to partner with PAPA and try to make this something that's available to not only the public, uh, the public access channel here, but also everybody that has a wave cable in the county. So uh, we're excited to get some of the projects that the Stevens Middle School kids are doing and what the uh, uh, skill center uh, students are doing and ho also we hope to bring in the uh, college students and that will create a, an infrastructure, a pipeline from middle school all the way to college and all of those will be feeding into the public access television station. We think it's going to create jobs and where kids when they get through with their education they can stay right here and work at home. So just thank you for all of your support and we really appreciate everything you're doing. Thank you. Nine point oh one. Board of Directors comments. Okay. So um, I actually did not have an overly busy couple of weeks. I did get to go out to Hamilton. There was a reading night for Dr. Seuss's birthday, which was super fun. Lots of all the little kids wore their jammies. The teachers were all in their pajamas. It was very fun. I listened to some wonderful stories. Did you wear your pajamas? I did not wear my pajamas, and I sort of regret it now. Um, and they gave out a lot of books, a lot of books to these kids. They had stacks of books. Uh, I don't know. That's a very good question. I don't know where the books came from. But they were... Dr. Seuss. Yeah, Dr. Seuss <laughs> brought them in. He shipped them out. Oh. Yeah, I know. He brought his stuff down for Seuss. Anyway, um, so that was when uh, we all went to the board workshop, where I think we all, I think we got did a lot of really important work. I really feel, I hope you all feel that we did some really good work there. Um, I went to the spring sports meeting, which, yes, I go because I have um, kids who are in sports, but I also like to see how information is being presented out to our parents. Um, and I think it, um, DJ ran a, a meeting where he really let the parent, he really emphasized that um, their schooling is number one, which I really appreciate. The grading policy, how parents can help their kids. Um, so, and we had a relatively decent turnout of parents. So. Um, I, I like to go to that. I also went to the orchestra concert because all the kids had their or the sixth through twelfth grade <coughs> had their orchestra concert because they were being adjudicated t yesterday. 
Um, and so they, that's important. Port Angeles always does very well in our high schools. Heading up to Bellingham this weekend for the With orchestra you. festival. If anyone is in the Bellingham area and wants to go listen to our, our little cherubs play. And last night I went to the eighth grade welcome night. It's pouring down rain. Oh my gosh. It was, and they did it differently this year. Generally what has happened is everybody goes to the gym, introduce all the, all the people, then they go, we all go on a tour in the rain, and then we go to the activities section where all the different activities that are available, from Cyber Patriots to the golf team, um, are all available there for the eighth graders to sign up that I'm interested in this. They put down their email address. So they get some connection with kids who are already at school. It's the, the uh, what do you call that? Um, the rider crew right. that takes these kids around and sort of introduces them to, to the school. Again, it was terrible weather, but pretty good turnout for the terrible weather. So the kids really got to meet a lot of coaches, they got to meet uh, some of the teachers, some of the students, uh, football team was there handing out candy, trying to get kids to <laughs> sign up. So, and the parents then were at the auditorium where we got sort of all the, all the different the nitty gritty of how your kid is going to graduate high school, which I think is really important. And now we've moved, I don't know, you know, we used to do, um, your counselor used to be by last name. That is gone now. It's all by grade level. So Mrs. Caverly, who is still on maternity leave, was very kind to come out of maternity leave and present last night to um, all the eighth grade parents because she <coughs> will be their child's counselor going forward. And she said she's more than willing to keep taking information even though she's on leave, which I thought was really cool. Um, she's going to go down to the middle school the next week and get these kids signing up. But they really explained what all the rules are. And Anne was very clear that <laughs> these are the rules now. We're pretty sure they're going to be this way for your graduation. But um, anyway, so I ha enjoyed doing that. And that is all. Thank you. Sorry, I was more than two minutes. No, that's fine. <laughs> uh, I, 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 I had my nose in policy books. Yeah. That's yeah, what I've been yeah, doing. Yeah, I've been yeah. studying and reading and writing. And uh, uh, Director Kelly and I have been working together, and I have lots of things to give you. Uh, also, I um, went to uh, tour Jefferson today, which was delightful, wonderful. I had a great time. That's my favorite thing to do so far, is to just be out in the schools, seeing what the children are doing, and uh, looking at them. And then tomorrow night is the um, Port Angeles Foundation. Education Foundation dinner. I'll be attending that. And so that's pretty much where I've been. Policy, policy, policy. Well, let's see. I have unfortunately been out of town for most of the intervening couple weeks, so I didn't get to do, I do a lot of. Um, uh, board related stuff. I thought our board workshop the other day was really, really great. Um, mm -hmm. And I think that uh, we've got some policies that we have to uh, to brush up. Um, but it, 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 was, it was very good. Emboldened by our, our ability to get. Um, I did stop by for a couple minutes um, tonight before coming to the meeting to Franklin Science Night, which is going on right now. I, well, it was. Um, it was long over now. Um, it was uh, wonderful have the, the parents and the kids setting up for that. I got to fire a um, I got to fire a baking soda cannon, and I did not I did not I did not hit the target, but I did not shoot myself in the face either. So those are. Those are bonuses. Um, and tomorrow, I am so stoked and looking forward to uh, judging the um, the future. Is it future chefs? Is that what we're calling it? The future chefs competition. I'm so stoked. My my son's going to come with me. My year old son's going to come with me. Um, he doesn't like anything that's not a quesadilla. Just so, just so you know. So. Come come hungry because you'll be eating a lot. Yeah, come hungry because you will be eating a lot. That's. Okay. okay, well, yes, the, the protocol meeting that was, we, we, whenever we meet like that, we have more chance to become better acquainted, so that was beneficial. I attended the last facilities meeting, and I went to the floor today of Jefferson, so that was, we went to about, I don't know, about every grade level, I think. Yeah, mm -hmm. So, and kids worked. 
on task for the most part. Yes, and there's always a few. That's the way it always is. So that's what. Uh, you sucked yesterday in kindergarten class. You get an idea of what it's like in kindergarten. In swim, right? Yes. Yes. Okay. Yeah, swim. yes, I did. Yeah. Once a year. They're busy. Maybe I do it. They're busy. Oh, they're real busy. <laughs> the, yes, the first, first in grade and kindergarten, especially kindergartens. Yeah. Those, those teachers. Yeah, Sandy has a 10 year experience working in preschool. Uh, the lower kids. And so she's I love them. School. Great conversation going on today about their experiences. Oh, it's just wonderful. Thanks. Just, we just have great early childhood program here. It's yeah. just wonderful. Yes. Yeah. So, I'm sorry I missed the last board meeting, but I was with a lot of people, about 200 people, at the Western Washington Consortium Native American Conference um, in Fife. It was wonderful. It's great to see all my old um, acquaintances and get caught up in what they're doing in the districts. And, uh, Great speakers, there's some really great speakers. And then um, I had a um, beginning meeting with the state auditor, because we got the state auditor working with our finance people in our district. And then Josh and I did the entrance audit this morning today um, and went through all the protocol. And you'll be getting all that in front of your notes, what we did. And I've been doing a lot of policy, 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 policy oh, review. And thank you to Jimmy for helping with a lot of the, once we do the policy committee, then I come out and Go right to Jenny and we get all the changes done and the policy when he's really great and on task and just a great group of people. The board workshop was really excellent and glad we've done all that. And then I've been doing the um, Washington State School Directors legislative teleconference calls on Fridays when I'm available. So those are always really interesting seeing. Um, we got to do one one day with Sarah, so it was kind of fun to kind of have that interaction and see what, what we do on the on the Watson board and what we do in the Ledge Committee for the last one. So. Jackson. Uh, well, I attended the active shooter seminar put on by the FBI. Of oh, course, wow. when you hear the word FBI, it's, everybody says, oh my. But it, uh, this is a very interesting phenomenon that's taken place across our country about covering inevitably what would you do in case of something that you really didn't want to do. So there's got to be a plan put in place. We have great plans, by the way, in uh, our school district. Uh, the, uh, the FBI will come at the request of the school district because they have 300 agents in Seattle, six in uh, the peninsula. But they, they will not take over the investigation. But they have teams of witnesses, and they go through a, a scenario of, of what we can do to help communities really at no cost in providing services. Uh, they have tactical teams that they send out to you, for example, interviewing witnesses about what really happens. From uh, 2000 to 2013, there were 160 events uh, that took place nationally, and 70% of those shootings were by a single shooter that did all the damage in five minutes in public areas, from public schools to Oregon to uh, Newtown, uh, at the airport uh, in Los Angeles, we talk about uh, interviewing a thousand witnesses. So th these are crime scenes and what they do and, and what happens after things like that happen. They're terrible things, but they're basically saying that the, the, the trajectory of these incidents have increased over time. And uh, you, you, the, at this seminar, they have fired they have police officers here, the yeah, federal, state, and local issues of uh, superintendents to talk about what do we do, how are we going to use our resources in order to do these things. Um, and it's something that no one really likes to talk about, but um, in a case like that, you really have to be prepared because safety is, is no, our number one concern. Um, but I, I, I got to tell you that uh, in, the, in the aftermath of, of what happens, you're just inundated with media. By the time something would happen at a high school, by the time I drive down to my, my office, it, it would already be on Facebook. It would already be on um, involved where all our phone lines are tied up. So the FBI gives you an 800 number, and they, they 
give to you steps and strategies that you take in order you, for you to deal with uh, something terrible like this. And uh, there are things that staff does in, in looking at these terrible events. You know, we, we look at poetry, we look at artwork, we, we can try to see where something like this could possibly happen in the universe. So you, this is something that you're quite familiar with in your business, but as educators, we've learned to keep an eye on uh, problems that we could possibly see, trends and things like that. So they, 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 they speak to those issues about what really you can do in the hope that you could try to do something like this on. But uh, a very uh, interesting time, uh, not a happy time, but something that we dedicate a lot of uh, experience and, uh, and study into that particular realm. So uh, it's nice to have the FBI spend time with us and go over um, this topic. The visits to uh, Stevens and to Jefferson, a lot of fun. I want to thank the board. Uh, I think that uh, as a great goal is to get out and see our teachers teach, to see our principals work, to see our classified staff, our teams of people working together to make this make their magical. And uh, it, it it is just fantastic to see you in classes and uh, to see the pride I mean, just come out of the faces of, of the staff and what they say to me about our board valuing what they do and validating. What, how they care about their, their youngsters and their kids in classes. So thank you so much for that. Um, the Skill Center, we had a, uh, a Skill Center superintendent meeting and uh, they've been really pumping up the, the hours over there and looking at summer school uh, packets for next year. And uh, I know Jody's going to be speaking to this on the 24th about what's happening at the Skill Center, but I, I did want to just kind of put a little tease out there for you about summer school. Uh, she's going to cover this pretty much in detail, but uh, our Skill Center uh, is part of a, a process that allows youngsters to look at career tech ed and do it across the district, and uh, we're getting the word out amongst the five superintendents across five different districts and expand programs that are benefiting uh, our youngsters and our staff. So that typically is, uh, that is my report. And we'll get to this one in greater detail at our next board. Thank you. Thank you. Now moving down to 9.03. Super Representative to the Board of Directors. And this is an informational item. Uh, I've learned through our procedures that we, we want to share what we're doing in our in our procedural process with you, that they're going to be really closely related. The <coughs> procedures are going to be very closely related of, of what, what we, we discuss in policy so that we take policy from the policy committee as you approved it and implement those procedures across the district. So th this is a, a procedure that we worked on with our student reps to the board and uh, I know the policy can have a ton of time on this. I know uh, <coughs> this is changing, but uh, by next year, the board will be looking at two representatives on our board, uh, from, one for Lincoln, one for the high school, and it gives staff a chance to gear this procedure up. And then the second one, may I, President mm -hmm. Kalia, uh, deals with uh, later will be an action item that our committees, we talked about two committees, the executive committee, we had to change that. Uh, it's on, on action so that uh, we automatically meet with the executive committee, both with Cindy Kelly and Sarah Mepler, come in and we discuss our agenda items and then we uh, work with the names of changing for the audit committee. Uh, Cindy Kelly and Dr. Jones met with our auditors today, in fact. So we, we needed to update the names on those particular topics. Okay, thank you very much. Any comments? Just from the student representatives, the, the student application says, please list two people who will give you references, and then there's three slots. Okay. So just, we just eliminate one of those slots. It's just a housekeeping thing. Thank you very much. Thank you. Any more comments? Okay. And we move down to 10.01, teaching and learning report.
Good evening. It's nice to have the opportunity to talk a little bit about what's been going on since February 1st, since I moved down here. Um, out of town last week, uh, doing some AWSP work. Got a call from Jenny that you'd like to have this report. So, kind of actually a little excited about being able to share what's been going on, too. Uh, Started officially, as you know, February 1st. One of the key things we're trying to do is build up the trust communication uh, process. So, in doing that, that had to happen with not only the, the CSB staff here, but the secretaries, HR, payroll, county, and special ed. And that's to spend a lot of time with individuals, get to know them as people and, and not in their job role as much as families and things like that to one on one back and forth. Also, you bring them coffee too and say thank you because I'm going to be learning a lot more from you than you are from me in the first time. So get on the right side. And then if you have uh, people like uh, Jenny and Marsha, you find out where the real workers are and who can help you out immensely and stay very nice to them. So the, it wasn't more than yesterday where you start building trust and communication. So that's been a lot of fun. But then to uh, back out working with the principals and who were my peers and now still are, and very hard working people, excellent at their jobs, being able to see the light and what they're doing in a different way, and being able to share with them my vision of where I think we need to go as a team. The key thing is a team here. It's not one person saying, here's what we must do, is what we'll do together and bring in some of the things that we haven't had for the last couple of years. And so with that comes not only the transition process uh, between the schools, which we've been working on a little bit, so how kids can move from one to another a little bit more easily and a little bit more with some openness to be able to meet the needs of kids that we worked on, as well as going through the school CSIPs and what's happening there and working with kids. Department-wise, I've still been meeting with the technology department, athletic, ELL, and so everybody around there. But what I really found out on February 1st is that there's this thing called CPR, which is not what you think, is the Consolidated Program Review, which was uh, due about six, eight months ago. And OSBI called me about every day wondering if that's, that's going to get it done. So I used the excuse of, well, I've been here for a day. Let me figure out what it is first. Find out there's 17 items then. Basically, the has come through every year, but every four years they do a big review. And there's always some findings. This year there was 17. I found out North Kitsap had 42, so I think PA did pretty good. But within that, it did require to go through and do quite a few things. Uh, there's parent involvement money in Title I. It's a million dollars in Title I, basically, that we get from the federal government. 1% of that's supposed to be set aside for parent involvement that goes to the schools and how parents do the things. When I do that, you have to have some meetings to find out what the parents want. We hadn't done that, in fact, because you also have to keep notes, sign-in sheets, and everything else along the way to be able to send that in. So we had that meeting and did it district-wide here about a week ago with the LSTs, checked that one off, sent everything in. The, you're also supposed to have a district improvement plan, which got sent in, but it wasn't acceptable because it had some wrong dates and different things in there. And looking it over, it was uh, not the strongest one, so I rewrote the district improvement plan to meet what we're actually doing this year currently and where we should be going between now and the end of the year. And if you want to copy that, we'd be glad to get it to you a little bit on. It's fascinating reading. I'm sure it would be excited about it. But in the meantime, it does hit the right dates, and it's what the teachers and the principals and things are doing in the schools, which I'll get to a little farther. Uh, there's a bunch of things that had to do with homeless and highly, ca and the highly capable qualifications, things that had to get checked off, done, rewritten, and put in. Those things all got done. There's a few things about how we identify lap kids. And there's a process you have to go that need to get turned in in the correct way, things along that way. This was not just me. Again, came down and they built trust and communication with several people down here because this is a team effort. Uh, HR, the, Mr. Harker helped me out in a couple of these things, as well as the special ed and David and, and others too. So it really was a team effort to get this thing done up and going through. As you know, there are several policies that had to, that were done, but they were missing some key things that legally had to be in there. And when that happens, you have to start the whole thing again. Mm -hmm. So working with WASDA and with Ms. Wilson and getting things back from them, getting it to the committee to overview, get it to you for first reading. And I see it's on today for second reading to get that passed and checked off. Is a, it was some nice work to get done at the same time. There's some job descriptions along the way and about four or five other things. The nice part is it all got done and I hit the button on March 1st and it's out of here completed. And I can go on to some other things. Mm. So that part, again, is the, I think a couple of you hit it on the head. It had nothing to do with going into schools and see what's really happening with kids. It did have to go with the money and the different things to be able to do it legally and right, so it needed to get done. Now for the fun stuff. Yeah. 
I just found also that there are 14 committees that I'm supposed to facilitate, <laughs> of which I've had 11 of them I've attended, and five of them twice already in the last five weeks. And trying to just keep organizing who's meeting what, what you say you're going to do, and back and forth is an effort in itself. There's some neat things, I have some ideas, maybe I'll streamline that a little bit in the future for along the way. There's some good work being done in social studies and language arts and math, nutrition, fitness, and just to name a few that have been going on there. Uh, while I was going through the EDS a little bit, and finally said I noticed there was this grant, rural grants at $75,000 that we hadn't finished. And what we had written it for originally, we didn't need anymore. So doing a quick call to OSPI, because I saw technology written there, could I rewrite this for technology? The answer was yes. And by the end of the day, we had $75,000 in the district, and that all went into those Chromebooks we were talking about. That the, you want to be a hero for the schools? Get them all Chromebooks this time of year. <laughs> so, <laughs> all right. yeah. so that worked out real well. Helped with that STEM piece a little bit, too. So getting out and doing the school visits has been the highlight, being able to get in and see what's happening. Because <coughs> kindergarten, whether you're teaching it, whether you're visiting it, I am so glad that when I was in elementary, it was fourth and fifth and sixth grade that I stuck with. So I go to elementary school, if I can see a kindergarten class and how fast they change and what they do, those teachers are amazing. What it does come down to, though, in the work is the teachers are the most valuable asset that we have. And what you see and what you're going through there is the same thing I'm seeing. We have fantastic teachers in this district. Principals working hard to, to enhance what they're doing, the same, with the, the same with the coaches and the other so supports that we have. What we've most recently been doing here is having our grade level meetings. And this is where I'm getting into the meat and the potatoes a little bit about getting back some structure that we've lost. Uh, and with that, uh, just being able to let the third, fourth, and fifth grade teachers have some time to talk and share instructional techniques and things has been a key part of it. But in math, for example, the Common Core, we have Envisions as our main math thing for elementary. They have a piece of guy that goes along there with Envisions. And they have a stamp that says Common Core Aligned. It is not Common Core Aligned. And I know this because we did this trick back in Stevens Middle School and got great results. We've taken it to high school and they're working with it. And so it's time to get it to the elementary. And so the, the teachers at third, fourth, and fifth grade over the last two weeks who have been meeting with them, have all bought into the fact that they agree that they can teach fewer things and go more in depth. But they have to be given permission not to teach some things. Because as a teacher, you're sitting there, you have a pacing guide, you have a math book that says Common Core, you think you have to go through and cover every single thing in there. If you take the time to go really into the Common Core strands and see what they require, and then go through the envisions, you can kick out about 20% that you do not have to teach. Because it gets covered in the grade before and the grade after. That allows you to put a lot more time into those key concepts. And one of the reasons that we've done so well at math at the middle school level on that way. The teachers were pretty excited about that idea, but also take some work. So I have found uh, two volunteers at each grade level so far. We'll take two days this summer. We're going to line it up so they can all be doing it at the same time to make that new curriculum calendar based on the Common Core, based on Envisions. But also within that, we put the new timeline in there based on district data. And But teachers are professionals, and they need to know that they still have the right to move things around and use what they need to teach. It doesn't have to be done with fidelity, as we've heard that word a few times in the past, because there are other things out there. It was a joke. <laughs> I gotcha. The, the, the key part about that is when you put together this curriculum calendar, you also add in the assessment pieces and where that's going to happen at. But more importantly, what are you going to use to instruct it? So you have your vision pieces there. But as the teachers met, whether it was third grade, fourth grade, or today fifth grade, they all listed off other things that taught to that concept. It might be from Bridges, which they had a few years back. It might be from Engage New York. It might be from here. So they all have a blank canvas to take a few minutes and say, don't write everything down you do. There's something outside of Bridges that you know works extremely well on that concept. Write it down. We'll get to those two people. So at the end of June, we will have the draft going out to each of those grade levels. We'll have it so it can transition from one grade level to the next to the next along the way and be able to actually, because the, the tongue in cheek part is, and you probably see it in your board one, the one that I saw, we're supposed to be focusing on math and writing. So the question I ask everybody, what is the district doing to support you in math and writing? And the answer is nothing. We haven't had it. Just the description that I gave you right there is giving them support in math. 
and we're getting to the, the, the getting to the nitty gritty. When those things get to the school level now, they have a right to move the, the curriculum around slightly because they need to look at their own data at that school and at that grade <coughs> level. So you don't do just district wide. You start at district wide. And then each school gets to tweak it. And the ownership of those third grade teachers and fourth grade that teachers there, it becomes their curriculum piece along the way. But what I did ask them is can we pick one assessment, whether it be for reading, because we're doing so much thing with reading, or a math that we agree in grade three, or in grade four, or grade five, that you'll all do. Because in doing my research in the last four weeks, found out in several schools in third grade, for example, two teachers using this test to do their assessments, and another one's using a different one. How can you have a good robust conversation if you're using two different things or three different things? Now, if we have one and we limit the amount of assessment because we do too much of it, and we do one piece that's required by the district, which I kind of laughed at, becomes me now, and then yeah. you know, turn around. But the teachers have the ownership and the professionalism to add anything else they would like to do or the building does, that they feel they need to go deeper into the data. But that doesn't mean just because they do it at this school, that this school over here has to do it. So they still have that ownership. But what, what they can come back and report to you on the CSIPs then is the same data on the same test from every school that they're all doing. That way we're starting to do it. So then we start talking about professional development. What do you need then based on this? What can we bring in? And not once and dump. But if we're going to bring somebody in, we're going to bring them in in August, in October, and again the next August, and we talk about if we do this, this is a three-year plan. You can't fix anything in one year. And you need to take three years out to go through and do it intelligently and with fidelity in that, in that sense. Doesn't mean you stop what you've been doing, but you've gotten pretty good at it, and you take on the next thing that needs to be supported. Uh, we did a similar thing with writing because we're supposed to be focused on writing. So I said, how many writing prompts do we have that you guys are all writing to at grade three or grade four? And the answer was none. Mm -hmm. So how can we work on writing if, and the teachers are doing a fantastic job. Don't get me wrong. So are the principals all the way. We still have fantastic people that way. We can help them though. And actually each grade level said, thank you. And they said, do you want to have one prompt? Do you want to have two? Do you want to do all three? I said, you're crazy if you do all three. But they are required to teach to three different prompt areas. But if you look at a fifth grade teacher who has to give a science test, they have to give a reading test. Within the reading test also comes informational text, comprehension text, vocabulary, listening skills, and vocabulary on there. They have to give the, and the writing process is there as well. And I'm sure I'm missing one other assessment they have to do. So there's only so much time you have to do. So what two of the grade levels have decided to do is we're putting together a writing prompt that they're going to give this June. Which, I, that's amazing that they actually wanted to give one in June. But the reason for it is we're going to get a prompt that's uh, SBAC alike, but we don't care about the SBAC, it's Common Core alike. Because we teach the Common Core, if you do that, the SBAC will take care of itself. But if they do the writing prompt, and they don't have to, two grades have said yes to four, one has said no, we're wait to the other, they're going to get their anchor papers out of that. To be, and it'll use the exact same prompt next November, December when they give it for the first time with their new kids. So they want to be able to give it, work the bugs out a little bit, and they want to be able to start scoring together like we used to, to be able to bring that kind of standard up, and then be able to have the anchor papers that see so they can show the kids this is the level, to show the parents this is the level of the standard. So, the grade levels have been amazing to work with, be able to bring that back. We've got some good, robust uh, conversations and being able then to know where we need to take and do things along the way. From that, we're bringing in some professional development. The high schools asked, they want to know how do you take Common Core rubric and the SPAC rubric and turn it into a rubric that you're supposed to teach and do writing to every single day. Can we bring an expert in and show the entire high school staff because it's coming out of the Language Arts Committee meeting? So down at the ESD, found where go down where the experts are. <coughs> the lady down there said, I'll be glad to come up. So our next DLA meeting, which is on the 22nd, and we've been sharing with the grade level, if you want to come in and listen to this, it's only for an hour and a half, we're going to try to stay on point to what's going on that way too. So we're bringing some of that in. And we're starting to talk about next year, besides what do you need. One of the things that we've talked about with the principals, and of course it's a negotiated thing a little bit too, in the August days, and one is how can we get a better bid for a buck out of the August days? 
And so we talked about, why don't we do all of our main stuff on day one? Why don't we do the breakfast right off the bat when everybody's there? 7.30 to 8.30. Then let's go into the auditorium and have our welcome where everybody's kind of fired up. Go down and take care of your uh, medical and all the other things that we do right afterwards. Go to lunch. And one of the best things we've done in the last few years was the Ed Camp. And we would have Ed Camp after lunch, but on the seven specific topics that we really want to get more in depth on. So we're going to cheat a little bit, not everybody just pick and choose. And what a way to come back to school for your first day back. You have the breakfast welcome. You go in and get the welcome over there. Go down and take care of your medical and all those kind of things. And then come back and go and get some specifics and very raw procedures and go to the, back to the building the next day. So still working on DLD, trying to figure out where that's going because there's like 150 classes that are being taken now. I'm not sure that's the direction we want to go with DLD. And I think it's becoming too easy, but I need to do some more research on that and find out how we're letting kids do that kind of opportunity. We need kids to be able to have every access they can to graduate and do things, but we don't want to make it so easy that you can just get mad and jump into something else. So I'm working on some research along that way, working with the building principals along those things. That's about five weeks left. What's been going on? And I actually didn't come down last weekend. So there's <laughs> stayed away for one weekend and getting some of this stuff done. So as we teach and learn Any questions? Yes, ma'am. I have a question about Common Core. Mm -hmm. um, when did this district adopt Common Core? Uh, the district didn't adopt it. The state did. So when, that was about four, five, five years ago, I think it was now. Remember, so right? this would be the fourth, fifth year? I think we're going under our fifth year. Mm -hmm. No, we're going into our fifth year. Yeah. 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 yeah, but and that's one of the things that everybody, so here's the common core, we need materials then. The publishers are always five years behind that. Right. And everybody's always. just stamping everything, so building teachers are scrambling and spending way too much time digging in. So if we could do a better job communicating those grade level meetings were a perfect place to start and help one another that way then it's not so much onerous on every single teacher out there because if we can help them in any way to, that, with their planning and increase their planning time that way in their communication, that they do great things if they're given the time to do it. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I'm in t I feel very duped by vision. It really was a hard sell to us as a board to adopt that. It's going to be common core line and your kids are going to do great and all I'm seeing is math. It's, and we did it with Fidelity. You know we did it with it was crammed down our throat. So I do feel a little duped by that. So I like that you're going with professionals and letting teachers decide. My only concern was when you said, though, you know, letting teachers sort of wiggle a little bit. Because the calendaring, what we have found, has been so important in that because our kids are so mobile at this point. And, and I just don't want them to go from Roosevelt to Dry Creek and they're covering It's the not that big of a wiggle. Okay, that's what, what I want to I'm talking sure. about. When, when the different grade levels meet this summer for those two days and they put together that draft and they have four weeks on this strand and six weeks on this strand and six weeks on this one instead of two weeks, two weeks, five weeks, they're already going more in depth. But we're doing it based on, let's use grade three for example, the data we have from grade three, from maps data, from uh, teacher recommendation things we heard and from or fourth grade, I guess I'd say, and from SDAC. And so, so that gives us a baseline start. Franklin might look at theirs, and their scores might have been 10 points above the state in certain areas. So if they're real, but they're also going to look at and talk to their the grade below, because those are the kids coming in. And so they're going to make a five-day, a four-day, a three-day difference on how much time they put into that. Where school over here might change two or three, so it's not a huge change. It's a uh, but three more days of instruction or five more days of instruction on one concept can make the difference. So if you're, if you're low in fractions, and you're already spending five weeks on it, but it's extremely low, so you're going to spend a sixth week on it, and now the other schools are doing five, that's because if you're building, that's the most important thing at that point. So they still will be able to transfer from one to one to the other, and they still have, will have one assessment that they all give no matter what, that we can look and measure growth. I just want to make sure that we're not getting a kid who was in a school that was great with fractions and moves to a school that, or no, the opposite, bad with fractions and moves to a school that was great with fractions and now that child has gone from already a little bit behind to even more behind. The, you know what I'm saying? I, I know what you're saying, I but, sure but I think the teachers are much more professional than that 
and they're going to differentiate within the building to meet the needs of that kid yeah. and that student. Uh, again, we have RTI for ELA, right? but our focus is math. Do we put some more time in or more personnel in the buildings to get RTI math going if that's our focus as well too? Yeah. So those are the decisions, but if I can have these kind of conversations for the grade levels and even, even more of equal importance have them with the building principals and get their take on it, then we put together a district plan and then I can go in and then start writing the Title I and the LAP and the Title II grants to meet the needs of what we've all decided. And because I guarantee you, being a principal the last 20 years, that hasn't happened for the last 10 years. It's absolutely and, the right yeah. way to be going about it. Absolutely yeah. the right way. Yeah. And I'm going to have to put a plug in for DLD. I understand that there's a lot of classes, kids doing it, but it does really alleviate some of those concerns for our high schoolers that, for example, are in a chamber, but then they want to also take a foreign language, and now they can't. Mm -hmm. They can do it online. So I want to make sure we're looking at why the kids are taking it. Maybe we can do a survey. Why are you taking the DLT? Yeah, and my strengths are at the elementary and the middle school, and I have some knowledge of high school, but I need to learn more. So it's in, and so want to make sure number one we're doing it legally, number two that we're getting the money back or the money's flowing from the from the state in the right direction, and we're not losing money by doing this because either the kid pays or, or we pay. Right. That but we had one student came in here and paid a thousand dollars the other day because he's taking <laughs> six classes. And another, another six. Yes. There, I know it's not. What day? He's taking six classes in addition to his high school classes. No. So he's taking twelve classes. No. Well, yeah, that you do have. They always pay us for six classes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. <coughs> so, so those topic, things are going on. Yeah. Those are things that. Yeah. I've been doing it for five weeks. I've, You're doing I've great. Tried, tried You're to, doing a few things. Fantastic. Yeah. You are doing great. Great report, Thanks. Any other questions? No. We're gonna take a break. I'm sorry. But it's almost. We'll be right back. Two, nutrition and fitness reports. Here it comes again. I have some helpers with this and time, so I ask them to come up now and go through it. So, also on February 1st, besides finding out the there's 14 committees they're supposed to facilitate, facilitate, I understand that all 14 come and make a report to you guys, too. So we're definitely finding a way to cut these things down for next year to help you and me out. But nutrition and fitness, which is, as the background you saw in there, that I honest, copied and based it from the previous reports, but seeing where it got started back in 2005 as a state law, that we needed to have a policy put in working both nutrition and fitness and the district has done that and to keep up with the policy requirements we're supposed to have an advisory committee which we've had ever since then as well. This year there's 25 people that I inherited on this list. I've seen four of them at the meetings I've been at. So I don't know where the rest of them are. I got kicked so, off, so sorry. All right, so there's one. We're down to 24 now and then the four oh, are totally showing up. But they are staying with the same goals and trying to get nutrition, uh, education, physical activity, and other things into the schools, including nutrition guidelines that have been selected by the school district, and measuring and implementation of local wellness policies along the way. The main work that was been done before I got there, although it's day one, we started, got to jump in and start working on policy, is they've been going for a Healthy Kids School Eye Grant, which the, some of the people behind me are going to talk to you about a little bit there too. If we get that, it's 100 bucks, 180,000, which they have some really neat things that are going to happen to improve the school's fitness and the facilities for nutrition too along the way. In order to get that grant, though, we had to update, like everything else I've inherited in the last month, the policy. So along with the other three that I fixed and sat down with you, with the help back here, because those three were easy compared to this one, because it hadn't been done anywhere in the state except Seattle. We are the second district in the state who has got this updated first, which, and it wasn't as easy because in the last we just send them away, they send you back the how-tos, there's four or five big gaps that say, ah, you have to figure this out yourself. And so the people behind me did a fantastic job. You've seen the first reading of it and the second, and I think we've got some good things happening. Uh, when we get all done, then telling you what's going on, our goal for next year is to start looking for the health education curriculum piece that we can hopefully do in a very reasonable small amount of time because we don't need to add more things to the plate. And it's the same with the 150 hours that, that Ms. Kelly's talking about. It would be nice to get that in there starting next week. But there's only so much time in the day, too. And so if you're going to put it in, 
what's going to go out. We take out reading time, we take out social studies time, we take out this. So those are hard decisions to be able to do along the way. There'll, there'll be continuing conversations to have that. But in order to get you some, everybody knows what they're talking about on this committee, I'm going to have Kathy Crowley let you know what's been going on with nutrition as far as this goes, followed by Campbell Kirkman is going to take on the health and fitness. And then it's always nice to have a parent side of it and what they're seeing. So Bonnie Schmidt is, is, is going to give you a few minutes of what she's seen as far as this committee was been done too. Thank you. Good evening. Um, let me start by saying that I always want a goal. And the goal that I look at for me is always how best can we meet the nutritional needs of our students given the ever-changing regulations that were faced under uh, national school lunch and breakfast programs. So in order to accomplish that this year, communication has been our primary um, focus, both internally and externally. Beginning of the year, we started receiving feedback, um, saw it on social media, received emails, phone calls regarding breakfast in the classroom. So had the opportunity to work with Pawnee, actually, um, setting up a group, and we met in October, November, with approximately 20 community members. Um, there were staff, there were parents. Um, we had a registered dietitian there with us to discuss breakfast in the classroom specifically. At that time, the very first thing we did was to review the requirements under the program. Um, so many people don't understand those requirements that HIFCA has forced on National School Lunch and Breakfast. So we spent time going through that. We had approximately a two-hour open productive meeting um, talking about different things. I think the two things that came out of the meeting um, that I left with were that everybody realized that the formulations of products that we use in school food service, even though they may have the same name as something on the store shelf, are different. They don't have the same amounts of sugar. They don't. Um, they may be made with whole grains. Those types of things. So we address that issue. And then the other um, major decision that we made during that meeting was to reduce our breakfast entrees down to no more than seven grams of sugar, with the exception of yogurt. Yogurt comes in at about 12 grams. Um, and that was huge for that. So we had to change a lot of products. We had to test and we continue testing numerous products um, that's a long haul we found a bagel with cream cheese it's just been discontinued by the manufacturer um, the only ones they carry are the flavored ones that have double the sugar and we can't use them so those are the ongoing issues there um, the menu changes we made to accommodate that are kind of a mixed bag we heard some real positives and we heard some real negatives. So the next highlight moves to meeting with a site team at one of our schools that was concerned that what they're seeing are students eating less because they're not happy with the choices and they're going hungry. So currently um, a breakfast pilot has been presented to site administration to determine whether or not they would like to be the pilot site looking at more um, scratch-made breakfast breads, granola bars that we can do, reducing the amount of sugar, things the students might like, overnight oats, homemade granolas, those types of products. Not only did we want to meet with parents and community members, we had a focus group at Stevens this year. We met with the students in the leadership class looking at what they thought about their breakfast or their meal program sorry um, lots of menu changes lots of new recipes being tested and implemented there well bore you with all of that but that's been actually very productive they gave us some wonderful feedback we've done it we've seen counts increase so that's been a promising change um, just to throw in in the midst of all this we had the OSPI state audit looking to make sure that we were meeting nutritional guidelines that came back very positive so that was a highlight of the year the other thing that just happened this week um, on a nutrition basis is that the A to Z salad bar was implemented out at all the elementary sites lots of new items for the kids quinoa salad roasted parsnip chips kale chips 
ugly fruit. It really is called ugly fruit. I don't know if you know what it is or not. Um, so those are some of the highlights. And I think what I was left with, um, and I think the most important piece to take away, is how do we as a group integrate a consistent nutri nutrition message? Because there's so many um, differing factions and we really struggle with that on a day-to-day -day basis. Questions? <coughs> All right. Well, nice to be here tonight. Um, I want to, my uh, overarching goal with, with being on this committee is to make sure that physical activity is a key component of our students' everyday lives from here for the rest of their lives and we need to make sure that we are providing them with the knowledge and the skills so that they can choose activities that they want to pursue throughout their life um, because there's nothing, nothing more important than being physically active to, to be healthy throughout your life. And nutrition has been a huge part of this committee since I've been on it, which uh, I think I, the longest tenured current person on it, Cindy was there before me, but I, I outlasted you at this point. Um, anyhow, we, uh, we've talked a lot about nutrition. I think we've done a lot of wonderful things in our nutrition program in our schools is great. We need to turn our attention more to the physical activity part of it, in my opinion. Um, in this uh, new policy, updated policy, the, the key points as far as physical education goes, that uh, we need to adopt and implement a comprehensive health and physical education curriculum. We have not had that in our district. Um, there is pieces here and there. We do not have a K-12 comprehensive policy, and uh, I, I hope that we can get that in place. Uh, we would like to have as many minutes as we can get for physical education. The state mandate is 100 minutes. The national re recommendation is 150 per week. It's going to take a lot of work to figure out how we can do that, but we have people that uh, are willing to work on that. and, and course it's going to be great for kids um, and in addition to, or supplemental to that uh, we want to make sure um, kids and adults are active for at least 60 minutes a day and that's not just PE time but throughout the day physical activity before school during school after school so we need to look at of course recess PE being key components but the physical activity breaks that uh, are great for kids that you know energize them and, and get their brains back on track during the day when they've been sitting for a long time, working for a long time. Uh, there is a training coming up this uh, Saturday, March 19th, the PAL training, physical activity leaders training, that's sponsored by the um, National Physical Education uh, Teachers Association. They are providing it for free um, for our school district and, and other local districts, and you are welcome to come. It's at Hamilton next Saturday, starting at 8 o'clock. Uh, we want to get people in each building that are going to kind of be the champions that, that will uh, figure out how we can get kids to have as much activity throughout the day as we can. Uh, the grant that we, that Chuck referenced that we uh, just recently turned in the application, uh, the key things that we're looking for with that, we, if, if you uh, are familiar with what we've done in the past, with we, we've applied for a lot of grants. There's, you know, we need to find money where we can and the, there used to be a national grant called the PEP grant that we have tried to apply for uh, several times. That is no longer available. So um, the monies that used to go to that is actually being provided to states for this Healthy Kids grant that we did apply for. And so some of the things that we have previously tried to get through other grants we um, are trying to get through this one, including the running paths at the schools that do not have them. So Stevens, Hamilton, and Jefferson don't have any kind of a running path or track. Um, and teachers uh, in addition to physical education, teachers will, will use those at the schools that do have them. Uh, we want to have um, additional or replacement of uh, some old equipment, the mats especially, that uh, are just wearing out and, and they need to be replaced and they're kind of expensive um, for our regular budgets that we get in our buildings uh, in the PE departments. And some other um, fitness equipment and uh, both at, the, at all three levels actually. And then there's the water bottle filling stations. That's actually a, a, a required part of this grant. They want to make sure that those are being put in there. We have some at, uh, at Franklin and at the high school, and we want to get them at the other buildings. 
And then the other part of the bread, because it has a nutrition component to it as well, is a, a freezer at Dry Creek that helps with their, I can speak to that way better than I could, but um, just providing the, that for that program. And then uh, one other thing that the policy is addressing is the waiver policy, which is uh, something that is a great concern for uh, our high school staff, uh, PE staff. We want to make sure that kids are getting the, the knowledge that they need through physical education classes and being active. And so if we have a waiver policy, we want to make sure those two components are being addressed. So those are the things that uh, affect the physical education part of this policy. When do you hear about this grant? At the end of the I believe at the end of the month. Yes. Yes. It's a lot of work. <laughs> I read that grant. <laughs> a lot of work. A ton of work. Yes. A lot of work. Yeah, I think that the, I think the water, the water bottle for they work, the mm -hmm. study that work. Yes. And I know that, um, as I said, the committee did this, but really the, the, the elementary thing would be just put the grant together. And so I think all of you for all the extra work. So it kind of came, they had put it all together, brought it to the Fitness Nutrition Committee, but they had worked on it for many, many, many hours, along with a lot of community outreach and stuff. I think that's where I break. Yeah. Thank you very much, Kathy. And the water filling stations will also take care of some of our mm -hmm. facilities issues. Right. Where mm -hmm. water is exactly yes. like mm -hmm. what you want to drink. Right. So you hear about it from the teachers, but parents are a key point in this. Yes, right. So it's nice to have Bonnie to be our, one of the parent reps, one who shows up at the meetings and participates. <laughs> we appreciate yes. that. Thanks, Chuck. Hi, my name is Bonnie Schmidt. Thanks so much for the opportunity to come and talk to you guys tonight. Um, so I'm a parent of two children in the Port Angeles School District at Hamilton. I have a fourth grader and a kindergartner. And I'm also an educator of young children in our community. I own a daycare preschool named Little Rhythms Learning Center. And um, a big focus of my whole curriculum there is nutrition for my kids and a lot of physical fitness and activity. So I have a strong interest and passion for this in my own life at home and, and um, what I'm doing with young children in the community. So. As a member of the community, there are a few things that are really important to me, for sure. And the first one is to provide our children with healthy and nutritious food choices. The second one is to provide our children with daily physical activity and fitness opportunities and brain breaks, as Campbell mentioned. And the third is to address each child as a whole. So recognizing that healthy nutrition and physical activity are essential parts of a child's mental, physical, and emotional well-being. So all of these things help support a child's capacity to learn and absorb information and put that into learning into effective action in their daily lives. So the committee has been working very diligently on this policy, so I appreciate your time and effort into reading it and looking through it and providing feedback. So some of the things that we are looking forward to as goals for the future in the committee are researching a nutrition education curriculum. Um, we've recognized that as a main um, source of concern because a lot of the children don't really know why to make healthy choices and so if we can get some nutrition education curriculum implemented into each school to help them really embody the reasons behind those choices that um, will help benefit them in all areas of life. Um, the second is we'd like to find really efficient ways to help each school implement and then assess wellness goals within each school that will benefit the school's performance while improving the health and well-being of all the students as a whole and our community. Um, the third thing is we'd love to continue to encourage and support healthy food options within the school programs and I've really appreciated working with Kathy. She's been so open to our parent um, concerns and been really willing to sit down and talk and I've, I've really appreciated that. And um, the fourth thing is that we'd really like to continue to support um, the review of the policy and to stay current in all these areas, because um, there is a lot of state and federally sort of mandated guidelines and things to keep up with, and it is, it's a lot to look at, but just to kind of stay current with, um, with what we need to. So um, that's all. Thank you so much for your time and your dedication to helping keep things really healthy and um, positive for our kids. It <coughs> makes a huge difference. The crux of all the learning that happens is what goes into their bodies and how they use them. So, thank you. Thank you.
<laughs> so one down, 13 to go to come back and report on you. <laughs> if it's something that I'm facilitating, one of the things that's always going to have is what's the goal for next year and where are we going? Because I think it's important not just to be able to give you feedback what we've been doing, but where are we trying to get to next year? And well, I'm going to say that curriculum piece, which is what really caught my eye in this whole thing, is this it is just tailor-made really for us going into that our nonfiction part of Common Core. But it's just, this is the, exactly the kind of thing I think Common Core initially wanted was to mm -hmm. have all these overlapping items. So I would love if the, our PE teachers can find that curriculum, that sweet spot, and we can get that into, I mean, this is how we're going to be able to find time, right? Mm -hmm. Is we're just going to have to make our nonfiction yeah. cover social studies and cover nutrition and fitness. So I would love if they could come up with a curriculum because they haven't gotten a curriculum. That's what right. was so clear. They've not had anything. They're just making this stuff up out of whole cloth and having a good time. I mean, they're doing good work is what I'm trying to say. But they needed more support. So um, yeah. I think this will fit right perfectly. They are doing good work. Again, the teachers really? are phenomenal out there. We can't add more to what they're doing. And so we have to be able to get creative that way. <coughs> you'll hear it again and again. And know Barry will jump up if I say we're going to add more curriculum, add something else to his plate. Cause, and we shouldn't to the teachers. But, but we've got to yeah. find ways to overlap and find ways to do exactly. it in different ways. It's not something new. It's, it's a new way to do. And it's the same thing we were doing in the grade level meetings this last two days and last week. They're finding ways. So if we're going to do that writing prompt, can we do it with a social studies thing on Martin Luther King and still be able to get the two short essays and get the listening piece in so they do it in that format and we're already going to do it and in for Martin Luther King anyway. Right. So let's kill two birds or three birds with one stone kind of thing. And so Absolutely. they got some great ideas and lines we can keep the leadership going and, and support them along the way. I think we can make some we don't need to make great progress. We're doing a very good job. Yeah. We will continue to rise and offer better and better things for our kids here in Los Angeles. That's my goal. Thanks. So my yeah, yeah, my yeah. comments would be here. I'm handing out you the law of the RCW. So, And I know that as we start to talk about reorganization and reduce the class sizes, um, I want you to look at the law. And of course, we take this oath that, to abide by the law. So one of the things I would say in number three, it says, by 2010, all students in grades one through eight will have at least 150 minutes of quality physical education every week. So I think it's a goal of us, and as I would listen to all the speakers today, especially the parents, about how these are things that we produce in the beginning, like we do about all day kindergarten. These are things that are valuable to kids, and as they become adults, and it's, it's um, instructional and it's habits that we create when we're young. And so if we instill this in kids, and I think we need to move, and I agree with Campbell. I was on the committee for, since it began. I was there when, when the board got an award, when we first did the first policy. But I think the board really needs to take it seriously about the 150 minutes. I think that, and I think that even though we keep hearing this, that we can't add more to the school day, what is important in children's lives? So, and so I just um, really want the board to um, really think about the laws and what's out there. So, I mean, we're six years later. Yes, Ian. Is this an unfunded mandate? Is this, is this an RCW that is... You know, some, Sandy, some school districts are doing it really well. I think that we need to get more partners. Um, I think that um, we were fortunate many, uh, several years ago that Krista Wynn was the National PE Teacher of the Year. Mm -hmm. I think that Krista and her counterparts have put together. I remember the years when we cut the budgets. We cut PE. We cut, we keep cutting, cutting, cutting. As we start to add more things back to the, to the thing, what are we going to add back? Well, so the real question, I mean, the question that comes to my mind, which is something that Chuck mentioned, is, or alluded to, is how can we double dip? You know, how can we be providing 30 minutes a day of, of physical education and have that also cover or help towards another room for as well? Is there a way to do you know, I'm, I'm like, for the, the PE class, I mean, not the PE, but the extra, the, the sports, if we would combine those at the high school, we could certainly cover some of it that way, I would think. Yeah, I think so, too. The, the sports that they participate in, that, yeah, that the legalities where the sports count and the yeah. recess doesn't count. No. And there's some things yeah, along the way. Yeah, the marching count. Yeah, the 150 minutes count. is a one for There's some good things to talk with the teachers about, because they're the key ones, to be able to tell the principals. If we add more PE time, we have to add more PE teachers. But if that gives more planning time for the core teacher, 
they can do a better job of being ready in the classroom and stuff. Because at Stevens, as you know, we have 90 minutes of planning, 45 for the team, 45 other. We get a huge bang for our buck for that. The elementary teachers have the least amount of planning time of any group. And so there would be some give and take. There's some things, maybe I have a little less instructional time in my core, but if I have more planning time each day to be able to you do even a better job and stay focused and targeted, it still might work out better. I don't know that we haven't had that discussion, but it's something that we're probably not going to fix for next year. But we should be having a target for two years down the line to be able to do that and have a well plan put together. And if it happens to be the year, if a bond does go through and six squares move up, what a year to start doing some change. It's just a natural fit to be able to make some of those things happen right then and there. But I agree with you. So We've been we talking about this for years. Right. Well, this is the problem though. The RCW yeah. is, this is how the state of Washington writes their RCW too. It is the goal of the Washington. Goal. Yeah. So, no, the district is not mandated. They don't have to. It is the goal of Washington. They write it so weekly that they give you an out. So then they can say, we're not mandating it. We're not unfunding it. We're just... It's not an unfunded mandate. Well, we have, it's an unfunded suggestion. It's, 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 it's an unfunded <laughs> suggestion is exactly what it is. And that, that's the kind of the frustrating part when you're dealing with RCW. I guess I would like to see across our district what, how, what schools are doing and how much PE time they're giving in each bill. So mm -hmm. maybe we want to include some of the stuff in the CSIPs about we need, where we need some of this. Well, well as you, if you read carefully through there, because the principals haven't seen it ready yet, there is a new CSIP goal for health and nutrition, right. which will be in their CSIPs next year. So that'll be fun, because that's part of what the policy and part of what the, the grant put in there. So I don't think it's a very huge thing to add to that right. and be able to add to that the principals and schools will be able to take that on in a wide variety of ways, but let them get some creativity of attacking it within right. the CSIP themselves. So that's already in there. That will be part of next year to be able to make that happen. Well. I'm hoping we can adopt some of next year because I think that the group, I will bring some information back about what the group's already looked at and what the cost of it is. Thank Fantastic. you. Thank you. Okay. Now we move down to, sorry, um, 11.01, Donahue House. You guys have been patiently yes. waiting for us, so thank you very much. Okay. Uh, Madam President, and members of the board, I'm happy to stand in front of you uh, to share some information from a business standpoint uh, with you tonight and give you a report here on enrollment here in a little while too as well. Let me give you a little background on, on, on what we have uh, lovingly called the Donahue House. So you have in front of you a picture of it. It actually stands here on the northeast corner of uh, the property that we use for the high school at this point in time. It, it was some property, the house set, sits on some property that we acquired in 1986. Um, it was used for a while. It has not been used for a while by our district at this point and sits a little bit in disarray. Uh, if you were to actually look at it, you'd see that the roof has some problems and the siding has some problems and some different things like that. Um, we have with us tonight Mr. John Donahue and his fiance Danny LeBlanc, uh, who Mr. Donahue is descended from the original owners of the house, and he would like to share some history, some thoughts, and a proposal with you. And at that point, then, uh, I'd like to give you some thoughts about um, what kind of a process we might be able to follow to, to consider uh, his, his thoughts and proposal a little, a little bit farther on that. If, if, I could, if I could have. Mr. Donahue, come up, and that be okay? And, and Danny, if you want to. Thank you. Um, yeah, I was just noticing that the house looks like it wasn't like it was, and it's, it's kind of been a landmark for a lot of years. And uh, my uh, grandparents believed in education a lot, and I just wanted to have a uh, throw my hat in the ring uh, if the school district decided to tear it down and figured maybe we could do something with it prior to it being destroyed just figured I'd come and talk to you see if uh, if it would be possible to uh, go through the hoops and acquire the home somehow that made sense to all of us thank you and, you, and, and it was built in 1909? Yeah, it was built in 1909 by my grandfather. Yeah. Who the Donahue family got here November 6, 1893. And uh, yeah, it's been 
a lot of uh, fun times and memories of the house, and I'm sure I hate to see it go bye bye. So, so now, did I read something or hear something correctly? You want to, you want to move it? Uh, move it or disassemble it piece by piece and restructure it uh, at another location as a possibility if, if the terms were right. I've got time on my hands. <laughs> and, and will. And, and a strong will, yes. This is what we also have acquired a piece of property. I, I own a piece of property with um, power, water, yeah, utilities, mm -hmm. everything except the septic drain plan um, in place to build an art educational facility. And it's right on McDonald Creek, and it's been a dream of mine as an art educator for many years. And I've been a substitute teacher in the school district for 15, 16 years now. And uh, I've seen how the decline of the arts in the school and um, everybody reading, writing, arithmetic is so powered up that the arts a lot of times kind of go by the wayside. And, and I really think that there's a real important need in this community to have something that will supplement our school in order that um, children do have that artistic that the ability to be educated in many different ways. My, my background includes ceramics, painting, sculpture, drawing, um, you name it, I can do it. I've got eight sculptures up at the Fine Arts Center. Uh, I think seven of which are still standing or have not been vandalized or stolen. Um, I painted the, the mural with Jackson Smart down behind the fountain, downtown behind the fountain. Um, I've been an active member of the art community here in this town for a long, long time, ever since I was a tot couldn't wait to get away when I was 18, couldn't wait to get back when I was in my mid-twenties. Um, and also just the need for an art educational facility and I think that the, I think that there would be a real, real strong, strong participation both with adults and children. And uh, got the property free and clear and so if we could figure out a way to dismantle this little guy and, and big guy and uh, restructure it on a piece of property and it's right on the discovery trail so it would have a real real good um, access and a good uh, I don't know I, I just think that it would be really accessible in a lot of different ways and like I said the property is already sitting there and it's flat and ready to go so we we're just trying to figure out a way to get that house moved have you when you talk about dismantling a house, I certainly have seen that, or pictures of that done. I know that's a possibility. What kind of time frame would you be looking at? I think it would be a, a, no more than 24 months. A couple of years. Yeah, and that would be, 24 months would be the longest it would take. But if that wasn't acceptable, that could probably be cut in half. And do you have any? Do you have any? Do you have any ex experience doing that, or you I do. You do. Okay. Yes. Yeah. All right. Any other questions? Thank you. For <coughs> yeah. Thank so you. So David's going to give us some ideas here. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So it seems there's a lot of heritage in this house. Uh, it's certainly been a part of the Port Angeles community for quite a long time. It, it, it doesn't, just for your own information, I did check the Federal National Registry of Historic Places and it that doesn't sit on that registry so there, we wouldn't have any uh, snafus, as, I don't think, as far as the federal government goes. Um, so there, there is a process in place for real property and the disposal of real property. And a house on land, at least, is considered to be real property. The interesting question of this that has yet to be answered, that really is the crux of the whole matter, I think, in my mind, is, is whether a house without land is really real property. And so I have, um, I tried to do a little bit of research over the last week, and I've had a couple of questions into some attorneys, the attorney general for one, and, and another real estate attorney. I haven't gotten back an answer really yet. So, so I think it would probably be smart to wait to hear from that, because if it really is part of the real property, if the definition in a legal sense of real property, then there's a process that you have to go through. You know, you've got to um, declare it surplus. You probably would need to do that anyway. Uh, in spite of the definition, uh, but then then um, you're legally bound to have an appraisal done, and by an independent appraiser, it's licensed by the state. Um, which when we did that for Fairview, cost about two thousand dollars, but that included land too. Um, and then 
and then when you offer it for sale, at least for the first year, you've got to offer it for sale for 90% uh, of the value. So, so I think at this point, I think it might be uh, good, maybe at the, the board's um, direction and Mark's direction, we could continue to investigate this a little bit further and come up with some ideas and work with Mr. Donahue on some thoughts and things too. Uh, it's certainly not something that we're using at this point in time, but of course that that's part of the decision that you guys would have to make as to whether or not it would have some value uh, for use in the district um, in that sense, uh, you know, or, or whether it could be used for something else. So those are just some of my thoughts that way from a business it, standpoint. It, we, still, we still have to finesse this process so we know exactly what the, yeah. uh, the find the property. Yeah. And, uh, and then we'll have direction from legally and technically what we can do. Uh, I know that this board has indicated that best wishes would be to provide an out for this property if we can so that we can start looking at our future with that real estate in here and uh, we'll see what we can do but right now we really don't have all the facts and we need to put our hands on it. Okay. And then just, to, just to kind of, uh, um, just to kind of comment a little bit on Dr. Jackson's comment there too. So, so with as you study the buildings and the things that you need to do, and that's why this could be an opportunity, and I think that's partly where Mr. Donahue has come into, into the picture a little bit too. You know, as we think about the use of that land and what's to be done in, with the, a new high school and some things like that, there are have been some talk about shifting buildings in different places on the land, and uh, maybe eventually the house would have to come down, and some things like that anyway. So, you know, maybe that 24-month period might not be a bad period. So, okay, is that something I could get back to you guys on? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, please. Okay. Okay. Uh, so with that said, I'd like to just give you a little report on enrollment here, just for a couple minutes, maybe, give you some thoughts here. Uh, you have in front of you a table here showing a trend, uh, current trend for the year. Uh, I'll just kind of point out some things here. I, uh, our enrollment compared to last year for March is, is up just seven uh, kids in total. That isn't actually on that table, but that's something to think about. The FTE that we have from last year is up about 50 FTE, and, and, and the FTE is where we are getting our funding. Uh, some observations from this table here. I think that you can see that the, uh, kindergarten through six has gone down a little bit, but if you were actually to look across that year, yeah, there hasn't been much change, and I know that's been a topic of discussion much this year. So that's something to keep in mind. Stevens Middle School is um, still kind of holding its own, still about the same. The high school is up a little bit. Um, well, that's not actually high school. I need to correct that. I keep doing that. Uh, that 9 through 12 also includes Lincoln. Actually, the high school is down a little bit if you were to look at this table up here. Lincoln's actually up, so it actually counterbalances that 9 through 12. Uh, I guess those were the only observations I had at this point. So it seems like we're pretty much holding our own. The district is, is slight, slightly up from last year. And we're still, even our numbers are still above budgeted numbers. That is true. Pretty that is true. Area. Yeah. yeah, 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 actually. Um, that was in one of those attachable tables. I have to find that, but yes. Yeah. And that's a good thing. Yeah, right. Yeah. Any other questions? Thank you. Thank you. We've got a 12.01 page, our report. All right, good evening. I uh, want to start off with going over our uh, current and recent uh, hirings. also want to talk about the uh, death of our substitutes and uh, where we are with um, the process for hiring for next year. So, um, as, since the last time I met with you, we have filled the following positions. A paraeducator at Dry Creek, a custodial position at the high school, three coaches at tennis and two volleyball, a cheer coach, and yeah, that does it for hiring. As far as open positions right now, we've got eight pair of eds open. Uh, two at Jefferson, two at Dry Creek, two at Franklin, one at Hamilton, one at the middle school. We have a custodial position open at the high school because it's kind of been a nominal effect there. 
uh, the Dry Creek Principal position, AmeriCorps Administrative Assistant at the um, eight hour per week position that was in their grant. And that's what we've got for open positions. So where we are as far as subs, because that, as you know, has been an issue this year. Uh, since the last time we met, we have um, filled, uh, we got one new pair ed sub, we've got three new substitute teachers, two of which will also accept para ed work, and a sub secretary, Karen Anderson, has set out for her 30 days, and so she can come back and sub. Okay. So, um, as far as para eds, we have uh, been doing our about every two week uh, para ed professional exam to get the folks highly qualified. So, we've got five folks sitting out there uh, getting ready to go that haven't started yet. We've got five sub teachers getting ready to go, um, and that's a good thing. But what I want to talk about is the, um, the one area that we've been struggling with this year, and I've been saying this over and over again, I want to bring some data with you, to you, and that's our para-eds. And so, since the beginning of the year, we have had 181 unfilled para-positions. And so, what that comes out to is about 1.3 per day. In the month of February, we had 36. So divide that by the number of school days in February, that was almost two positions per day we would not be able to fill. And here in March, to date, as of today, we've been averaging almost three positions per day not being able to fill with substitutes. So it's not that we're not doing anything about it, but what ends up happening is that if we are adding a pair of position or somebody leaves, then we are drawing from our pool and therefore the pool keeps shrinking. And so we are struggling with that. But again, uh, we've got, uh, we just hired a new one, we've got five more waiting to go, and it's just been a continual process. So we're, we're trying to get, try to stay on top of that. Um, as far as the process for next year, we've already started that. We have sent out our intent to return letters to folks. We've got the majority of them back, some are still trickling in. And if you don't know what that is, that is the, I intend to come back, I'm not sure, no, I'm not coming back. And so the majority of those are coming, have, have come in, like I said, do a little bit of um, bird dogging to get the ones that haven't come in. And so the next process is to talk to the principals and therefore, you know, are there teachers that are looking for reassignments? What positions do you have open? Are there people coming off of leave of absence? And then it's what positions do we have open? I'm off to the Spokane Job Fair, which is next Tuesday. And then the following week, uh, the 24th, is the Tacoma Job Fair. So that's where we are with the HR part. So question is... Okay. Public records request. Public records request. Since the last quarterly public records request, we've had six public records requests. Uh, one was from an attorney uh, looking for job descriptions in student records. Uh, we had the WEA that was looking for uh, a budget, some budget status reports. Uh, a parent was looking for their students' records. The Attorney General's Office was asking for some student records. We had an employee looking for their personnel file, and we have a company out of Florida that's looking for purchasing records, and they do that all over the country. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, now we have an action item. 1301, approval of the roof restoration for Hamilton. Uh, we've got a uh, got a roof at Hamilton that was put on originally in 1978. It's over the uh, 78 modernization. So well, we're going to try to do a re restoration this summer. It's uh, 22,000 square feet and um, it gives us a 12-year warranty. So uh, it's a nice project. It, um, it's almost $6 a square foot, which for a 12-year warranty, that's a pretty good price. So it's also being bid through KCDA which they handle all the contract, they manage the fees. So I'm asking you to approve this work. Um, estimated 125,000. The reason you see that the quote is 120,000 and that's a guaranteed cost, but I also like to have them do a infrared scan. And so if there's any moisture under there and we have to tear up some insulation and do some sheeting, uh, they have a pre-bid amount per square foot. It just gives us a little bit of wiggle room. So I'm asking you to approve 125,000. I will move that. A second. There's a motion with a second. Sarah and Josh. Any discussion? Any discussion? Any discussion? All those in favor say aye. 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 
Okay. So this is the gym at the high school. It's a real similar project. It's uh, five roofs up there, though, including the auxiliary gym, the area that's over the wrestling, uh, the foyer, the health room, and um, the penthouse that's over the uh, <coughs> uh, the uh, um, the main walkway there. So it's. Uh, a lot of spaces that you notice that if we do it all together, we save about $20,000. And again, we've got uh, three of these roofs are currently leaking. We're working on them. But again, it's a 70, it's a 78 roof that was a composition and it's it's lasted its life plus some. So we're coming up on 40 years. So we, we need this roof as well. So I'm asking it to do 150,000 on this roof. I will move. We have to have a motion and a second. I will move to approve. Second. Second. Oh. Excuse me. Uh, motion from Josh. Seconded by Sandy. Any discussion? I just wanted to have a look at the metal roofs. They just want to put these schools or the span or something. You can, but there has to be a slope. And these are flat roofs. So we cannot use a metal roof on a flat roof. Yeah. Yep. And part of the other problem is in Port Angeles, we have a height moratorium. So we can't go over the 35 foot height. And so that's why a lot of our buildings are flat because they're right up there. Um, Jefferson Gym is right at 34 feet, five inches. So we're right underneath that. So, um, yeah. No, I love metal roofs. If we could do metal, that would be great. But, but this we can. That's the same thing. It's a 12 year warranty. Um, buys us a little bit of time. And it's a, again, it's been through KCDA. That's a state. It's already a state bid contract. And it was nice last night to have so many community members actually get to witness firsthand some of that leaking mm, yeah. um, in those gyms. So thanks for, the, for organizing that race. Yeah. That was fantastic. That party. was a good race struggle. It actually. really, really was. Yeah. The wind, too, as it pushes stuff in. Yeah, it's it special. Helped. It helped. Yeah. It really did. <laughs> yeah. My phone's busy usually have mornings like that. Yeah, so. we had the feeling. Yeah. Any other questions? All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Abstentions? Now 13 0 3, approval of phase 3, 4, and the Roosevelt and the Corners High School Choir. Actually, I need to make clarification it is, it is not the chorus room, it's the orchestra room. It's for okay. Ron Jones. So the first one, Roosevelt Elementary School flooring. Uh, we're doing uh, three little sub halls, and what we're doing there is the summer. We'd like to come back and do the classrooms, the last bit of carpeting for the classrooms in this remodel. But we have to have some place to put the furniture out onto that's already done, or we're moving the furniture three or four times, taking up custodial. So this is spring break, it gives us, um, it's $20,000. It's not <coughs> too big of a project for, for, for Roosevelt, but it's a needed project to, to make um, process this summer go smoothly. Same thing with the, or not the same thing with the chorus room. In the chorus room, the orchestra room, excuse me. It, it, yeah, is this the orchestra room or the band room? Because it also says in the... It should be the orchestra room. It says it Port is. Angeles High School band in yep. the actual, uh, actual estimate. So that was the carpet lady that came in and measured it up. And it is the orchestra room. It's for Ron Jones. It's the only place in the 200 building that doesn't have carpet. And so it's a hard floor. They're trying to practice in there with, with tiles and the, the acoustics are just absolutely horrible. So he's done very well for years and years. We all know Ron's programs, mm -hmm. but it does need to have some type of a, of a soft surface. Yeah, yeah. He, and this is, this is a needed, a, a needed uh, um, addition to that. So I'm asking you for $19,000 for Roosevelt and also 7143 for uh, the orchestra room at the high school. Similar. I'll second. There's a motion by Sandy, second by Sarah. Um, any discussion? Yes. Yeah, I mean, I did, we just have to, we just have to, we just have to amend it to be the PHS orchestra room. Mm -hmm. okay. Right, yeah, okay. Yeah. And it's all one room, really. Yeah. 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 But yeah. Any discussion? Any discussion? All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Discussion. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay. 1304 approval of policy 5010, non-discrimination and affirmative action staff. Second reading. Second reading, as is. I'll move. Second. 
to move with a sec oh, moved by Josh, second by Sarah. How do I read? Oh, Sarah, then Josh. Um, Sarah, and Josh. Josh. Yes, I'm trying to do that for Jenny. Um, any discussion? Any discussion? Any discussion? All those in favor, say aye. 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 Opposed? Abstentions? Opposed unanimously. Passes, excuse me. 1305, approval policy 5222, job sharing staff member, second reading. As is, second reading. We've already uh, had these discussions. Well, second, not as is. <laughs> well, it's changed from the policy. You're right, and we did move. We made the changes uh, as recommended under Section A that the superintendent or the designee, and we made the changes under D that the employee uh, to work full time. Uh, blah, blah blah blah. That it would be the employee upon recommendation by the superintendent. So we really own this, and then we push it up. That was your concern. So yes. as as it was as you were recommending was changed. I will move it. I'll second. Moved by Sarah, seconded by Josh, that we approve policy by two two two. Any discussion? Any discussion. Any discussion. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Abstentions. Passes unanimously. Thirteen oh six, approval of policy thirty two ten, non discrimination students. Yeah, this was our big one, and this, we worked on this for almost two years. Uh, we had to redo it, and now we've come up with the proper plated descriptions in place. So uh, we were asking for it. Uh, and I um, I move so move. Second. Move by Josh, second by Sandy. Any discussion? Yes, I okay. do have some discussion here. So, if I'm reading this correctly, I think I am, it lists a cross-reference uh, to policy 3211, mm -hmm. transgender mm -hmm. students. Mm -hmm. We yes. do not have a policy 3211. Well, it was a listed reference, but we don't. We do not have it. So we can delete that. Mm -hmm. and we can strike that. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So it would be as amended. As amended, I think. Yeah. Cross-reference. Well, I was, uh, that's that's mm -hmm. jumped out of me as well. Then I will mm -hmm. move that we approve it as amended. Okay. Second. Okay. Josh Good spot. Second. Our Josh moved it. Sandy seconded it. As amended, as a cross-reference. Any discussion? Any more discussion? Mm -hmm. uh, so we're not going to have a 311 at all? We will. We will. Okay. We don't have We can't reference it. Right. Okay. Yeah. okay. And, yes, Andy. and all these have been checked for, for legal. Yes. Okay. Yes. Okay. Before it comes to the policy committee, from once it comes from legal. Okay. okay. I'll check that. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you for asking. Uh, do we have votes? Yes. We have voted. Well, we've, I move. we've got we've got two, we've, we've got a nested it. we've got a nested proposal, so it's been moved that we approve the amendment. amendment. Right. All those in favor, say aye. 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 Opposed. Abstentions. Okay. Okay. Well, now we, we so we approved the amendment, but no. now we have to. No, we don't. Yeah. We approved it as amended. Okay. I know in no. one, so we kind of do it a little bit different. Yeah, yeah, we don't do it. All right. Yeah, it's thirteen oh seven. Roberts rules. Approval of policy sixty seven hundred and nutrition and fitness second reading. This is the second reading. Good uh, work with Chuck. I mean, this is uh, a <laughs> lot of work. Yes. I move that we approve this policy. I second. Moved by Josh, seconded by Susan. Um, any discussion? Any discussion? Any discussion. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Abstention. Passed unanimously. 1308, approval policy 1240, committee's first reading. I'll move it, but I would like to amend it um, to a second reading. I second. Yeah. I, second. I, I second that we pass it as amendment to second reading. Three. Okay. So a motion by Sarah, seconded by Josh, that we move it to a second reading. Any discussion? Are we going to discuss this? Yeah. Yes. Right. Okay. Uh, I have a question about these committees. Um, it says committees of the board may be created by a majority of the board. Um, so all of these committees that we serve on have been set up by the board. Yes. Some have been set up by the board. 
some have not been set up by the board, some are, I, I, I don't understand where they all come from. So they're usually by board action that we do set up a committee or a task force. Yeah. Okay. The recommendation would come from the superintendent and then the board would approve. But so the, standing, the, the standing committees, like nutrition and fitness, that's not what we're talking about here. These are the, just the committees of the board. Like nutrition and fitness, policy committee, these are not those committees we're talking about, correct? That's we're just talking about the you. audit committee, the executive committee. Those two committees, because we that's rescinded it. the other one. That's the and we need to say... I think she's talking about more than that. I don't know if she yeah. is, but this yeah. is not, that's not what this is covering. Yeah. Right. This okay. is just committees of the board. The other the committees board. are district committees. Yeah. I right. think that we ought to say then what they are. Okay. So then, if the these procedure. are standing committees, then we ought to say standing committees. Okay. Uh, we ought to, because it's very confusing. Um, if we could. Yeah. Right. I think that's where the procedure comes in. Yeah. And I'm glad you're asking questions on this because staff is asking questions on at what point do we look at the committees. And I know I mean, some of you serve on two or three committees and it's overwhelming. So well, well, again, I, I mean, are we conflating the different types Wait, of committees? This, I thought, this, I thought 1240 is only talking about those two committees This is of the, the problem. Right. It's These are two committees separate committees. We already we had a call, call them what they are. Look, we had, a, we had this discussion already about procedure 1240. Right. That calls out the executive and the audit. That is what Josh and I are talking about. But if you read through the 1240 down here, right. it says all of our committees. committees. Right. So there, the procedure has nothing to do with the. Um, well, I think the procedure probably needs to include more language than it does. Okay, now now what is going on? I'm sorry, I'm just all so over the So committees of the board may That's be created committee. by a majority of them. Now, explain that to me because I don't quite understand. We can be, we, it just means that it takes a three it takes a, a three person vote to create a committee. Right. And same thing happens when you get rid of committees. But this is the policy twelve forty is talking about all committees. Well, it does. The procedure was only talking about the is this your right? Is only I talking about I executive I, I and um, audit. and audit. So therein lies the the question. I mean, do we need to have two <laughs> committee policies? One that says no. standing committees, and well, I don't, I'm, then if we don't, then I think we need to add more procedures to 1240. Um, Would you agree? I, I don't know. I don't agree because oh. if we create all of these committees, that's how they were. Yeah. Okay. Created. That's that they were commit. They were created mm -hmm. by the board. Mm -hmm. the, all the boards that came before. Mm -hmm. us. Right. And, and we can get rid of them too. Yeah, they're good because I think we need to have some long <laughs> discussions about that. But I just want to be sure that this talks about every committee, not just executive committee and and. And what I'm saying is that the procedure only speaks to those two committees. So as well, we all we heard, the it's right. Mark's job to change the procedures. Right. So yeah, yes. Right. Yeah, yes. What? Well, <laughs> he's going to have to bring something back to us. Well, to glad for some back. Yeah, because we, yeah. we do. I mean, I, I agree. We need to have some we need to have some written procedures around the the committee. unwieldy committee. Yeah. Oh, so it's, it's just it's no it's uh, it's no one. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Well, I mean, there's a lot of work that has to get done, and I think about it was transparency. Okay. Then why why did the they create all those committees? Fine. Yeah. Oh, I did But not. we need to have some written guidelines for So yeah, I, I think we need to, at some point in time, sit down and, and have a work session or however we do this about all the committees, not just the two standing committees. Okay. All the committees. Okay. Because I'm, you know, I'm going to committee meetings where they do the same thing over and over again, and I'm wondering why I'm there. And uh, and and what what my role is there? For example, on the on the uh, education foundation, you know, what is that? They don't consider me a part, a, a member of that. I'm not a vote. I can't vote. So, 
you just said, listen. Well, I have a very similar question, but yes. from the other direction, because I can't, I can't make most of the committees, because yeah. most of the committee meetings. Right, or they're, they're they're the yeah. right. So well, okay, I, so I agree. Can we? But I think we can approve this policy. Right. Yeah. And then, and then, then assess. Our friend Mark to assess okay. the how the so money. I call for the question. I'm not sure what it is. <laughs> so I think the policy is okay. The procedures need to change. The okay. procedures. So what have we? What What are we getting ready to vote? We've just moved it to a second reading, okay. so we don't. Until we go over it all. And then the question. procedure needs to have more detail into it. Okay. Thank you. Well, agree. Thank you. Yep. Thank you. Agreed. Any more questions? Okay. Um, all those in favor, say aye. 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 Opposed? Abstentions? Passes unanimously. 1309, approval policy 5011, sexual harassment, second reading. And this is uh, another policy that we worked on in detail and uh, we're waiting to move forward on the second reading. Yeah, I move to pass. I move to approve this policy. I second. Um, motion by Josh, seconded by Sandy. Any discussion? Yes. Yes. Um, I hold this policy near and dear, and I, uh, I think this is um, a very important one. And I have two places that I marked it that I have questions about. And the first question is under definitions, and it is the last sentence. And it says, the district prohibits sexual harassment of district employees by other students employees or third parties involved in this school district activities. I don't know what by other students means. This is this is about staff. This is not about students being sexually harassed. Just staff, correct? Mm -hmm. Is that correct, Mark? Yeah, I, I, I know what you're saying. It should read the district prohibits sexual harassment of district employees by students, comma, other employees, comma, or third parties. Yeah. The other is in the wrong place. Okay. But yeah, I just want to be sure. Can sexually harass their teachers? Oh, yes, they can. Yes, they can. Yes, so they that's can. our only So, okay. yeah, we just switched the other to in front of employees, not in front of students. Okay. And uh, on the next page, under staff responsibilities, uh, first sentence says, the superintendent will develop and implement formal and informal procedures for receiving, investigating, and resolving complaints or reports of sexual harassment. I want to know what informal procedures mean. I think everything should be formal. I don't, I have a problem with informal procedures about something like this. Tell about commercial procedure, does it? Well, that's why, I'm, I'm yeah. gonna, that's why I'm asking. I just, why do we I, have it there? I would like to take out informal yeah. procedures yeah. and have it all be formal procedures. Uh, I recommend that if you do that, you really got to run that by legal because I think that is has it a legal a, term? I think that has a very specific reason why that's there. And okay. going back to uh, when I was in the military, and if you had an informal um, investigation, it, it uh, if you had informal procedures, and this may not be what it is here, but I, I bet it's close. If you had informal procedures, it protected the identity of the um, individual of the alleged victim versus if you went the formal route they gave up some of those they, they gave up some of those protections against uh, disclosing their identity so if we're gonna make that kind of change we better run that by the okay is that can you want, yeah, you want can to do, we that? do that? So I'm going to move that we table. So we can table this second and send reading it back. until Chuck, next. Chuck, are we going to live with that change? Uh, this is not one of our, uh, this is one of the policies yes. that we have to yes. send on, don't yes. we? Yes. We've already set that part off. Let's just yeah. go through a process now. So being okay. able to table it, take it from the is not going to hurt anything as far as our CPR yeah. report. It doesn't change the meaning okay. of it. So, so that is my motion that we table. Oh, they have to withdraw the motion. Oh, okay. They have to withdraw the motion. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, I'll withdraw the motion. And you second. And I'll withdraw my second. Okay. Well, now Sarah's making a motion. I'm going to make a motion to table this till next board meeting. Okay. Thank you. Uh, second. Thank you. And Josh seconded. All right. Any further discussion? Any further discussion? All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Abstentions. This should be something that we also okay. put on for. Good evening. Okay. 
know we're on the downhill slide, so I'm only going to take about 45 minutes or so. Um, I'm here to ask for the approval of the English credit for Melissa Klein's uh, commercial art program. I apologize at the last meeting. I wasn't able to attend. I've been on a three-week stint right now trying to get over this flu. I've got the respiratory one, and so I've been living off the cough drops and coughing fits. So um, I apologize I wasn't here to present and give you all the information that you needed. Uh, I believe that I submitted the paperwork that you needed and requested at the last board meeting under the tentative approval. So her frameworks and the signed document should be should be attached, I believe, are they? Mm -hmm. okay. And Melissa is also here tonight in case you have any questions that you'd like to ask her in regard to uh, the English credit and the process that she went through. Okay, so I'll move this. We'll second. Is there a movement now seconded? And any discussion? Okay, so I'm the one who was sort of a sticky wicket last time about it. And it's still, this isn't, I guess I've been on the board long enough, but this isn't still this. What, okay, I, what you need? What I was referring to was exactly what you said, that, those frameworks. Right. Where it would say, mm -hmm. like, this gives me the three criteria. Like, but what I, before the teacher would say, okay, this, I'm doing this, which satisfies this. And oh, that's what then the teachers and okay. administration sign off on. Did the frameworks not, is, is the frameworks not what you were looking for then that I submitted? Not just the I didn't, form, I there was seen we, any we didn't, we, didn't get it, we didn't get anything last time. No, not last time. I submitted it for this time that you had asked for, so there, it should all be we there, have right? Is the, all we have all is the All those long pages mm -hmm. that were, yeah, see I don't have. Yeah, more than that, there should be frameworks along with it. All I have is the equivalency credit mm -hmm. evaluation. No. Yeah, there was no framework. There no. wasn't? No, there was no framework. I did send them, I swear. <laughs> I did send them. Um, well, I guess uh, if you, if, I, I, I apologize. I sent them over. I didn't know that they didn't make it. Um, I have complete, I really do have faith in in what has <laughs> been decided. I just usually like when I'm going to say And I, I did send things. that along okay. with it and yeah. somehow along the ways it must have gotten not sent through the wires or something. Mm -hmm. There is a document that accompanies this form right. that is probably 12 pages right. long. Right, that's the one. And that was supposed to be with this. I apologize it didn't make it. I didn't know that it didn't make it. Um, I do have to present on the 24th. I can I can just shoot all of you the frameworks if you like. We do have them, and oh, I apologize that <laughs> it didn't hit the the agenda. I know uh, KJ well enough to know he's not going to sign off on something that he's very persnickety about. Is <laughs> what counts as an English credit? Right. Does it make any Does it make any substantive difference if we hold off and delay this till the next meeting so we can look at it to satisfy? Um. I don't, I don't know. It doesn't make a substantive difference. It, yeah, I don't, well, in my opinion, I don't believe it would because she did do the presentation in front of the English chair at the high school. And the English chair looked at all of her documents, including the 12 page or so document that should have been with this that she right. presented to them, along with an entire box of documents that her students had been doing as far as the comic book creation components and the blogging that she does with the students, there is this much documentation to back up what she's been doing along with those frameworks that I, I really apologize shouldn't have, should have been there and they're not. I, I don't know what happened to them and I'll take complete responsibility for that because I should have double checked that those had hit the, the agenda as well and I, I apologize completely. This is now is the second week and, and <laughs> or the second meeting and they were there they were on a legal size piece of paper, the yeah. 12 pages, and they must not have shrunk and gone through properly. But um, she did do her due diligence as far as getting all the signatures. I, I, it's, it's totally up to the board. I can provide those for you. It's not a problem. I can shoot them to each one of you so that you can see. Um, like I said, I do have to come back on the 24th and present in regard to the 9th and 10th grade issue and what's going on at the Skill Center. I would be happy to, we could talk about it again then if you'd like. I'm, I'm totally okay with that. It's going to affect any of our kids and their credits. There are kids. Now. 
This is okay, Melissa. It, it will. Yeah. I okay. Have, I have students who want to enroll in my program, and they, but until they are sure that they can get English credit, are holding off on that. See, that's a substantive answer I need. Yeah. So yes, it will matter. So it's moved and seconded. I will call the motion. Okay, more discussion. More discussion. I will forward you the frameworks. All those in favor, say aye. 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 Thank you, board. Opposed. Abstentions. Now, just as a side note, um, in regard to the Donahue House, just throwing it out there, being the skill center and, and supporting my people and all of that, I do have a construction gentleman who taught at, at SQUIM and was working on the conference center there under the city, uh, and they provided all the materials, and they, the skill center, um, Riley Stites, did all the free labor with his kids, that the Donahue home may be able to be revived if you're so inclined with the free assistance from my program that the teacher is willing to bring in his kids and do all the free labor and do a, a remarkable job if the school is interested in revitalizing that Donahue home. Mm -hmm. And We're just for cost. It. It. Uh, but then, it was, I'm just throwing it out there. So yeah, um, on a side note. dismantle a home as well. Well, he, they could. They, probably could. they could. And then just as a side note, um, I'm going to give you information ahead of time in regard to the ninth and 10th grade. I know that there's been a lot of resistance, a lot of talk, a lot of miscommunication going on over the ninth and 10th grade issue. This is documentation that I will be talking about at, on the 24th as well. I would like you to all to just take a look at it. It's information only because I think there's a true imbalance right now that I'd like to make more balanced and um, so that we can have a real, uh, a concise and accurate conversation when it comes to it on the 24th. So thank you for your time. I appreciate it. Thank you. Okay. And we move to 13.11. Approve, well, this is really the consent agenda. So it's really no. more. No. Yeah. And I think refresh. Oh, here's Rush. Refresh right there. Sounds good. And we get <coughs> So we get to the so it did it Talking about 503 originally? It's 503. Yes. Yeah, yeah. But that's not, that's the principal approval uh, of uh, the principal salary, yeah. 1311. Yeah, that we moved it to 1311. Are you seeing on your computer? I'm seeing 1311. Right. When you do the consent agenda, yeah. 13 approval personal action, that's all of those things in that 1303. She didn't say 5.03. She said she was going to move the. You, you can't just move a couple things out of the consent agenda, approval of that personal action, without moving the whole thing down there. You can pull something out of the consent agenda. Yeah, you can pull it out of the consent agenda, but at the end of the approval of personal action, there are five things there. You can't just pull two things and approve the rest of the other three things. Because there's five things there. She didn't state the 5.03, she stated. Yeah, she did. 5.03. She did. She, she did. Should, she did. Should, be, should be all 503. Yeah, right. right. That's right. what I'm saying. Sorry. Okay. So, so are you seeing 503 there? Yeah, but it's it's no. revised a little bit. It's not all, all right. the way. All right. So you have a copy of the principal. I'm not seeing anything. I'm not screwed up now. Oh, okay. So go ahead, Mark. So we have to go to So we have in front of you uh, a copy of the principal salary proposal for 2015-2016. Revision B. Yeah. That's fine. And. So do we want to take one, everything at one time, or we want, want to do it all together? Want to do it individually, or you want to do it all at once? Mm -hmm. All at once, I think. Okay. So we're going back to 503. I want to vote on the contract and That's the why association. I know, but you can't just pull two out of the approval of personnel action when there's five things there. I know, but I think we got the thing. It's at the beginning. How? Yes. Okay, but so the actual personnel items were 
approved the only by the contract is the only condition you take us to get uploaded. You can't, Jenny, take when when you get it 5.03 and there's five things there, you can't just go say, I want to pull two things and leave two other things. You can't do that. You gotta take everything. You have to pull everything out oh, okay. individually on all five things or individually move it as a whole section. Okay. So okay. what is then it needs to be seen as five point oh three, not G if you listen it's a only that item. Okay, well you can't do okay. that. So now you want to just vote on each one, one of the five I'm things. asking you guys what would you well, then that if, then if you have to then you have to then that's what we need to do. Let's yeah. do each of the five things. Okay, so do them individually. 5.03. Okay, here we go. 5.03. Okay, so here we go. The first thing is the copy of the principal salary proposal, 2015-16 revision B. That is the first item for action. We're doing the salary. We're doing yes. the salary proposal. Yes. Okay, so it's down here, but not wait a minute. Wait, wait. Now. It's, it's 1311. No, I know yeah, that, but the but document the itself doc isn't there. there. Should be one page. No, it's yeah. not there. It's just gone. It isn't there. Oh, because the attachments aren't there. Yeah. The attachments are concerned. Jenny, can you go back and put the attachments back up? Oh, I'll have to go back and get them to do it. Get back to that. I can't do Do you want to do the other ones first? Let's do the top three first. Okay. And all the ones that are still 13.03, that's where they're showing up. Okay. Or, uh, excuse 5 me. 5.03. Yeah, I'll, I'll take them Those first. Those are still showing up. Uh, okay. So let's start with consent agenda certificated March 10. Okay. There we go. Start with that. Uh, I move that we uh, approve consent agenda certificated March 10, 2016. Okay. I will second that. Okay. So there's a second, or a motion by Josh. Seconded by Sarah that we approve consent agenda certificated March 10, 2016. Any discussion? Any discussion? Any discussion? All those in favor say aye. 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 Okay. Okay, consent agenda classified March 10, 2016. I move that we approve consent agenda classified March 10, 2016. I will second that. We okay, have a motion by Josh. Seconded by Sarah that we approve consent agenda classified March 10, 2016. Any discussion? Any discussion? Any discussion? All those in favor say aye. 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 Okay. Now we go down to 2015-16 spring coaching contracts. Uh, I move we approve uh, 2000. I move we approve that. Second. There's a motion by Josh, second by Sandy, that we approve 2015-16 spring coaching contracts. Any discussion? Any discussion? Any discussion? All those in favor say aye. 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 And then we'll just wait for a few minutes. How about we take a five minute recess? We have copies, one part copies of this contract. Uh, right. This one is shared. Right, can I have copies of that? Yeah, definitely. Huh? Yeah, definitely. Oh, sure. uh, so Could you run hard, hard copies of that? That's the. Mm -hmm. yeah, it has to be a secret thing, Barbara. <laughs> okay. Everybody got a copy of Okay. Okay, so now we're going to do a copy of the principal salary proposal 2015 16 revision B. Everybody has a copy in front of you. I will move that we accept that. Second. There's a motion by Sarah, seconded by Josh. 